They cut me two times across my right rib. They cut me two times across my right pec. They cut me one time across the left side of my neck, one time across the right side of my neck. They cut me from the bottom of my armpit all the way down to the bottom of my hand. And after they got through cutting on me, they said, son, you're gonna be in this hospital for the next 40 days. I walked out of the hospital on the third day. They said, you broke a record. How did you do it? And I said, first and foremost, the thing I want y'all to understand, I will never let a circumstance or a situation define my life. My mother got pregnant with me at 15 years old. I grew up on the east side of Atlanta, about five minutes away from where the Atlanta Braves play, in a neighborhood by the name of Kirkwood. Drugs, gangs, violence, you name it. And I came up in a two-bedroom home, 14 people. And I used to sleep on the floor. My grandmother, Miss Daisy Johnson, she used to come to us and she would say, one night out of the week, you all get the opportunity to sleep in the bed. And so when I got to sleep in the bed, it wasn't like I got the bed to myself. And I was like, man, I got the bed to myself. It was five more of my cousins in the bed. And so we slept three to the foot and three at the head. And so as a kid, pretty quick, I had to make a decision of what I wanted to do with my life. Because in that same house, I had eight uncles, all eight of which are still going in and out of prison till this day because they sold drugs and they were in gangs. And so I looked at it. And it's kind of like that quote that says, learn from the mistakes of other people because you can't make them all yourself. And so I saw them selling drugs, but I also saw the outcome. And so I said, I'm not selling drugs. I'm not joining a gang because I see what that role leads to. Either I'm going to end up dead or in prison. I said, so my best bet may be to go to the NFL. And so I went to my cousin by the name of Tamar and I said, listen, man, I want to go to the NFL. I feel our family deserves a better way of life. Let's work for it. I said, we're going to be patient. We're going to engage in consistent action every night. And so every night we would go out and we would race light pole to light pole in Kirkwood. No shoes. Light pole to light pole every night. And so one night we were getting ready to race and down the street came a big blue pickup truck. And it pulled over to the side and out of it got a white guy, first white guy I ever saw in my life. True story. And my uncle Bobo, who just got sentenced to 40 years in prison, he was on one corner. My other uncle Johnny, he was on the other corner. My uncle Bobo took off running and he looked at me, he said, Ink, don't talk to him. Saying to me, that guy has to be the police. Coach Trey walked up to us, nicest guy in the world. He said, would you kids like to play organized sports? I stepped to the front, I said, yes, sir. He said, go in the house and get your guardian. My uncle JJ was there, I ran in the house, I said, uncle, there's a guy outside. He asked me like to play organized sports. I told him yes. He said, well, I go in the house to get my guardian. I'm coming to get you. Will you please talk to him? My uncle said, sure. My uncle walked outside, Coach Trey said, would you like to sign these kids up for organized sports? My uncle said, yes, sir, but I hate to tell you, we don't have the money. He said, don't worry about the money. You get them to the park and I'll take care of it. That same guy still buys me drawers and socks until this day on Christmas, and I'm 29 years old, and he started when I was seven. You see, most nights after practice, everybody would leave to go home, and I always had to sit in the park because my mother worked at Wendy's. And my mother didn't get off work till about 10 o'clock, 10.30 most nights, and I would be sitting there in the park, and I loved it. I didn't want anybody to take me home because when I went home, I was sleeping on the floor with roaches and rats. And so anytime I got in solitude to dream, anytime I got in solitude to think about what I wanted to do for my family and my community, I took advantage of it. And so most nights, I'll be sitting there in the park and I'll be looking up at the lights. And I'll be envisioning myself doing things in the NFL, envisioning myself doing things for my community. And just as the lights would always go out, my mother, she would pull up and she used to drive an old Buick Regal. Hubcaps off the car, seats torn up, the car was all beat up. And she would pull up and she would put the car in park. And I would always hop up, I would run over to my mother, I would give her a hug and a kiss. And I would say, Mom, if you don't mind, can you please sit back in your car? I have to do some extra drills, I have to go to the NFL. She would never have to work another day in your life. And I knew she was tired. And every night my mother would say, sure, Ink, and she would sit back in that car. Those car lights would hit that field, and here you had a seven-year-old kid doing back pedal drills, running sprints, running laps, chasing his dream to go to the NFL. And just beyond those car lights, I could always connect with my mother's eyes. And so it made me dig a little bit deeper, it made me push myself a little bit further, it made me work a little bit harder. I live by this thing called the harder you work, the harder it is to surrender. You see, the reason people quit, they don't take pride in what they do. The harder you work, the harder it is to surrender. And one night, my mother couldn't pick me up and she called Coach Trey. She said, Coach, I can't make it tonight. Can you please take Inky home? And so he put me and about eight guys in the back of his pickup truck and he said, Inky, I'm gonna drop you off last. And so when he got to my house, I got out on the sidewalk and I'm, I'm standing in front of 125 Warren Street and I look back at Coach Trey. And I said, why, why are you doing this? Because where I came from, people didn't just help you. It was, I pat you on your back, you got to pat me on my back. You remember I did that for you, you got to do this for me. And I said, why are you doing this? 
And he looked back at me and he said, son, son, I want to tell you something. And he said, I don't want you to ever forget it. He said, son, the more you make sure that somebody else's life is okay, God will always make sure that your life is okay. And I will never forget, I got to high school. And nobody in my family had ever been to college. They all dropped out, ended up in prison. My high school, the name of it was Crim High School in Atlanta. They used to call it Crime High. They used to shoot teachers. And my first day, I walked through the metal detector. And a cop was standing on the other end of the metal detector. And he said, what is your plan, little man? I said, my plan is to go to Division I. He said, no, nah, you'll probably go to cell block D1. I said, no, nah, you got the wrong block. He said, I heard that before your uncles came through and said the same thing. I said, no, nah, I'm telling you, you got the wrong guy. You know the first person I went to see when I got my scholarship paper? But you know the most amazing thing happened? It wasn't that I went to college. I had three little cousins sleeping on that same floor that went to college. I saw friends in my community come off the corner from selling drugs and go to college. I saw friends in my community come out of gangs and go to college. All because I shifted my mindset and it wasn't about me. I broke generational curses in my community because it wasn't just about me. I didn't care so much about me going to college. I wanted the ones coming behind me to get it. And I got my scholarship up to Tennessee and they looked at me when I first hit campus, 135 pound kid soaking wet in the SEC. And the first reporter, he asked me, he said, Inky Johnson, do you even think you're gonna play at the University of Tennessee? He said, you're 135 pounds. I said, not only am I gonna play, I'm gonna start. I said, you made a mistake. I said, see what you don't understand and this is what most people do. They base judgment off of what they can see. But what they don't understand, the moments that make you who you are, the moments that they can't see. You see, anybody can be on their best behavior when somebody is standing over their shoulder, watching them, seeing if they're gonna do what they're supposed to do. But what they're reporting and see, you see, he can see I came from Crim High School. He can see I was 135 pounds. He can see I was 5'9". He can see all of the stats. He can see all of that. But what he never saw was when I was in a park with my mother when I was seven years old. She was sitting at Beard Regal at 10.30 at night. What he didn't see was every Saturday morning at 5.30, I was up running two miles to a fire station and two miles back home. What he didn't see was every time I slept on that floor with ropes and wraps with my cousins, I got up every morning went to school and never made one excuse what he didn't see was on Christmas Eve when a cop when a guy came through me and my cousin's window and he stuck a nine millimeter and a 45 in both our face and took all of our Christmas gifts and we had to stand on the curb and our mother told us y'all just be grateful he didn't see that and those were the moments that made me who I am and so now his opinion didn't matter his opinion would never become my reality and my freshman year, I played special teams sophomore season came broke the starting lineup you know the first person I went to see at media day And I'll never forget my sophomore season, I finally made it to the point in my life where I felt as if everything in my life was lining up. Spiritually, I was getting disciples. Life was in shape. On track to graduate in three years, life was in shape, education. I still remember the day I was in the film room watching film and I was watching the California Bears and my defensive backs coach Larry Slade came in the room. He said, Inky Johnson, I got some good news for you. And I dropped the clicker and I said, coach, what is it? He said, son, you're a projected top 30 draft pick. He said, all you have to do is play these next 10 football games. You're an automatic multimillionaire. I ran out of the room. I got on the phone. I called my mother and my grandmother. I said, listen. I said, after this season, we will never struggle. I said, we will never miss another meal. I said, after this season, our lives are about to change forever. Little did I know our lives were really about to change.
First game, we come out, play against California Bears. I get an interception. We shut them down. We get the victory. Second game, we're playing against Air Force. It gets late in the game. Found ourselves in a dogfight. Quarterback dropped back. He released the ball to the running back coming down my sideline. And I approach the tackle like I approach any other tackle. And the way I'm approaching it, either I'm going to knock you out or you're going to knock me out. I'm 165 pounds. I can't play with anybody. But at the point of contact, when I hit this guy, something different happened that had never happened to me before in my life. I hit him, and it seemed as if every breath in my body left. My body went completely limp. I fell to the ground. I blacked out. I'll never forget when my eyes opened, my teammates ran over to me. My first guy that was over was Gerard Mayo, the middle linebacker for the Patriots, one of my best friends. And he said, Ink, get up, let's go. I said, I can't. He said, what do you mean you can't? You're out of lockdown corner. We need you. Let's go. I said, I can't move. I said, there's a shock going through my whole body. I can't feel anything, man. One of the scariest moments of my life, and the shock eventually left, and it stayed in my right arm and hand. And I remember as I was lying there, I flipped my head to the left, and I could see the doctors and the trainers running onto the field, and I flipped my head up to the sky, and I said, God, I said, surely nothing has happened in this moment that can alter my life. I flipped my head back over to the left, and they were bringing the spine board out. I flipped my head up to the sky, I said, God, I said, that's precautionary measures, right? They get me up on the spine board, they're wheeling me off the field, and I looked at the doctor because I couldn't feel my right arm. They had poked me with all type of needles. Inky, can you feel this? Can you feel? I couldn't feel a thing. And I said, Doc, can you, can you lift my right arm and hand? He said, sure, Ink. And he raised it up, and I, I lifted my left, and I pumped it to our supporters. And as he was bringing my arm down, I looked at the doctor. I said, oh, yeah. I said, I'll be back. Never thinking that would be the last game that I would ever play in my life. They get me in the ambulance, things turn up a notch, I still don't pay it any mind. They get me over to the hospital, say, Inky, we're going to take you back and run some CAT scans. They took me back, they ran the CAT scans, and they rolled me back into my room, and I'll never forget it. All in about a 15-second time frame, I was lying there in my bed, and I could see over my right shoulder. And I looked at my father, and we caught eyes, and my father, he went to take a step in, and he looked at me, and he said, son, I can't do it. And he walked out. My mother, she came in, she was running. She kissed me on my forehead, she said a prayer. She said, ain't everything is gonna be okay, and she ran out. And as soon as my mother stepped outside of the room, the doctor rushed in from the opposite side, and he said, hey, get in here, we gotta rush this guy back to emergency surgery, he's about to die. I said, what? I said, my mom just told me everything was going to be okay. Like, this is total opposite. You talking about I'm about to die. I said, what happened? He said, son, what happened? You have busted up some clavian artery in your chest. You're bleeding internally. I have to rush you back and take the main vein out of your left leg and plug it into your chest in order to save your life. And when I woke up from recovery, the same doctor was standing over me. He said, Inky, I have some good news and some bad news for you. I said, you got some bad news for me? I have to tell him I was about to die. I'm still alive. How bad can it get? I'm still here. He said, the good news is, son, we saved your life. I said, thank you, sir. He said, the bad news is you have nerve damage in your right shoulder. I said, cool. He said, we got to send you up to the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. I said, cool. He said, but the problem is, Inc., you probably can never play the game of football again in your life. I said, no way. He said, yeah, Inc., you got some pretty bad nerve damage. I said, no. I said, Doc, no disrespect, man, but I'm, I'm eight games away. Like, Doc, no disrespect, but this is about to change my family's life. Doc, I've been working for this ever since I was seven years old. Doc, there's no way. God, not now, God. Like, let me make it to the NFL so I can help my family first. Like, I mean, we miss milk. And you're talking about my career could end right now? Like, no way. And I snapped out of it. I said, man, I never cheated. I said, there's no way. I never cheated. I never cheated myself. I gave everything I had to it, and I respected it. I never cheated. There's no way that my career can be over. I said, send me up to the Mayo Clinic. And after several visits, I'll never forget, this is when reality set in. It was me, my mother, my father in the room, and the doctors came in. They said, Inky Johnson, here's the deal. They said, son, you have torn all the nerves in your brachial plexus. They said, your brachial plexus are the nerve roots that go from your spine, and they come down, they control your shoulder, your arm, and your hand. They said, you have torn them at all levels. They cannot be replugged. They said, son, we hate to tell you, but your arm, it would never be the same again. Your hand, it would never be the same again. Son, you can never play the game of football again.
And the next morning I walked into the doctor's office. They said, son, what option did you choose? I said, no disrespect to you, doc. I'm not choosing an option. My situation is out of your hands. They said, cut with the cute talk. I said, no disrespect to you, doc. Cut me where you got to cut me. My situation is out of your hands. I'm not choosing an option. I said, I know I will come out of this situation, okay? And so I went back to school the next week after they had just saved my life. I was back in class. I had to learn how to write all over again. I had to learn how to walk all over again. I had to learn how to tie my shoe all over again. I had to learn how to bathe all over again. I had to learn how to live life all over again. Never one time did I say, let me go home. I need a break. Never one time did I go into the training room and said, I need some time off. Can you all just give me a little leave time? I need to go back home. I need some time off. My life just changed last week. And they came to me and they said, Inky, go home. We know how much the game of football meant to you. I said, yeah, you know how much the game of football meant to me, but you don't know how much life means to me. You see, the thing we have to understand about everything that we're a part of, first and foremost, it's a blessing by God. And when it's a blessing, you can't help but to give everything you got to it. My life got saved. I got spared my life. I almost died. The doctor came to me on the field. He was on one knee and he grabbed my wrist and he said, son, you don't have a pulse. I don't even know why you're still living. And my last doctor visit, they came to me and they said, sorry, Inky Johnson, you will never be able to use this arm and hand again in your life. I said, no disrespect to you, doc, but I will use this arm and this hand every day for the rest of my life by the way that I live my life. Every day, I'm going to impact someone's life. Every day, I'm going to empower someone. Every day, I'm going to inspire someone. Every day, I'm going to encourage someone. I live by this thing called empty the bucket. And when people hear it, they think it's a cute slogan, empty the bucket, but what they don't understand, it's an unspoken law, empty the bucket, it's an unspoken law of accountability and responsibility to me on this earth and my existence and everybody that is connected to me. I may be crazy, but I don't know. I just believe that I'm supposed to give everybody that is connected to me the best version of me. I just believe I deserve to give my wife and my children the best version of me. I just believe the people that I'm of service to on this earth, I deserve to give them the best version of me. Everybody wants to prize, but nobody loves the process. Everybody wants to be a champion, but nobody's willing to put in the work that it takes to be a champion. Everybody wants to hold up the trophy and say, man, I did it, but nobody's willing to put in the work that it takes to do it. I love the process. I love the thought of working for what I want. And I firmly believe you're never supposed to wish for it more than you're willing to work for it. Your expectations are never supposed to exceed your effort. But a lot of people, they wish and they're not willing to work. And the great thing about life, life has a funny way of testing all of us and seeing how bad we really want what it is that we say we want. Because the thing I know about people, people can talk to talk. And people do it very well. But life is going to hit you with a certain level of opposition. Life is going to hit you with a certain level of adversity. And life is going to say to you, you said you wanted it. Now let's see how bad you really want it. But the great thing about it, if you love the process, when opposition and adversity hits, you will have a way of embracing it and using it, not only for yourself, but you will use it to make everybody that's connected to you stronger because your vision has to be larger than yourself. If everything that you do is just about you and for your personal gain, something's going to come up against you that's going to be a lot tougher than you. And if it's just about you, the moment you hit it, you're going to quit and give up every time. You know, protocol, they call me in the world, they say Inky's a speaker. Inky's a motivational, whatever the case may be, Inky, whatever, whatever it is. But what they don't understand, I'm in the people's business. Not a speaker, I'm a servant. Anybody that has direct contact with people on a daily basis, that is an opportunity to change someone's life. I don't 
ever pass up an opportunity to be of encouragement to other people. Don't ever pass up an opportunity to inspire someone. Don't ever pass up an opportunity to empower someone. Don't ever pass up an opportunity to show someone love because the thing about it, my wound, like you can see this. You can see my arm. My wound is visible. But it's a lot of people in this room that are wounded and you can't see it. And it's internal. And so the, the opportunities that we pass up to be a blessing to other people, we can save their life with just one encounter. When we talk about me to we, when we talk about process over product, when we talk about sweat equity, when we talk about better together, do we really understand what that means? Because sometimes the thing about life, life always comes along when we make up our mind and try to distract us. But truth be told, we all know that we're stronger together. I have been working my whole life. And what I didn't understand by being determined to chase something, by being committed to it, and what commitment is, commitment is staying true to what you said you were going to do long after the move that you have set it in has left. You see, people think commitment is saying, yes, I'll do it on the days when it feel good. But I have been committed to everything that I ever started in my life and I never stopped and I never quit it. And so by being committed to everything that I started, I finished it, it built a certain type of spirit, it built a certain type of mentality, it built a certain type of individual. And so now I couldn't quit even if I wanted to. I couldn't lay in the bed even if I wanted to. I couldn't stop even if I wanted to. I had too much sweat equity in my life and everything that I was doing. Because I understood my existence wasn't about me. I went from me to we a long time ago. I understood the process is more important than the product. It wasn't about the outcome for me. Whether I made it to the NFL or not, that was inconsequential in God's plan for my life. But I was going to fall in love with that process because I understood by falling in love with that process, it was going to turn me into a machine. I asked them, I said, if it were some younger people in the exact business that you started, and they asked your advice on what should they do to build something similar to what you all have built here, you know, what advice would you give them? And he said, well, I would tell them, you know, do things the right way, you know, treat people right. And he said, I would tell them work. You know, work your tails off, right? And I said, um, you know, in my head, I said, man, we live in a world to where I don't know if, if people appreciate what things produce. In my whole life, the only advantage that I've ever had as a person, I've never been the most talented, never been the biggest, the fastest, the strongest, even though I was a four-sport athlete my whole life, you know, at the top of every sport that I've ever played, I was never the most talented. I was never the fastest guy, never the strongest guy. I've always been a small guy my whole life. You know, I was that guy I would show up, and they knew that I was the guy that played football. They knew behind the jersey I was probably number three or number 29 in college. But when I would show up on the scene, I would always get the reaction, this is the guy, because I was small. I didn't even look the part. But the only thing I've always had, my only advantage, was I wasn't afraid of hard work. But most importantly, I knew what I represented. And so by knowing what I represented, my commitment, my dedication, and my, my perfection to my craft and what I represented, it was always on another level. And so now when guys did 10 sprints, I did 30. Because I knew I was working for something greater than myself and what I represented was always greater than myself. And for example, two weeks ago, I was with a kid downtown Atlanta. And I took him downtown and me and my wife, we have a foundation. It's where we work with homeless shelters, we've adopted three. Right? And we work with kids, teenagers, right? We take them, we put them in uncomfortable situations, and we challenge their perspective and their thought process about life. So it was this 15-year-old kid. He had been acting up in school, giving his mom problems. He hadn't seen his father since he was born, basically. And I take him downtown Atlanta, and I take him right under a bridge. And so now you got Turner Field, you got where the Falcons play, where the Hawks play, you got the world of Coca-Cola, you got a jail, you got these successful companies, you got people going to work, you know, got the briefcases doing their thing, you got life happening. And then you got under a bridge, you got a gentleman, a grown man, sound asleep, cardboard box, sleeping, as if a person would be in a bed, sleep. And I looked at the kid, and I said, do you think he planned to be there? A 
I said, do you think when he got of age, at a certain point in his life, do you think he said, man, you know, one day I'll probably be sleeping under a bridge on a cardboard box? The kid said, no. I said, what do you think happened? The kid said, I don't know. What do you think happened, eh? I said, I think life happened. He said, what do you mean life? I said, I think at a certain point in his life, he was excited, he was jacked, he enjoyed something. He was a part of something special, something had a legacy attached to it, whether it was his family, whether it was a dream, a goal, an aspiration. I think at a certain point, every day he got up, something he represented, he got excited about it, he was driven, he was committed, he was dedicated about it, he was stoked about it, he was jacked about it. But I think at a certain point, life made him forget what he represented. And life stole his joy, his peace, his happiness. Life zipped him of that drive. Life took that dedication, that commitment, so much so to the guy that was once driven, to the guy that was once happy and excited about what he was a part of and what he represented and the legacy that was attached to it. That same guy ended up sleeping under a bridge. The only advantage I've ever had, everything I encountered and everything I ever hit in my life, I understood what I represented and life will never take that away from me. And so on September 9, 2006, when I'm eight games away from being a projected first round draft pick and my life changed overnight, something I had been working for since I was seven years old in a park with my mother, watching her sit in an old beat up Buick Regal when she had me at 16 years old. And she took me back to a two bedroom home, 14 people sleeping on the floor with roaches and rats and missing meals when I was a kid. It was times when I went to practice, I hadn't even eaten. And guys would be out there complaining, and the only thing I was working on was my work ethic and my drive and my dream and my goal to get to where I was trying to get to. And I knew if I would have stopped in that moment, I would never get to where I was trying to get to. I would really miss meals. And I'm working toward this dream and this goal, and I finally get to the point. I can smell it, I can taste it, I can see it, and I'm a part of something. I'm a part of something like a Southern Motion, but it was University of Tennessee. I'm a part of a game to where I got my guy. Right? And we go and we work every single day. We show up 5 o'clock in the morning. We're working towards something. We got an element of collective character. We got an element of responsibility, accountability. We got an element, man, when I tell you I got your back, I got your back. When I tell you I care about you, I care about you. When I tell you I love you, I love you. I was a part of something. And I get to the point to where I'm a projected first round draft pick and I go out and I make a tackle and this is the thing that people don't even know. People know my life changed behind the game of football, but people don't understand the play and how it happened. People don't know that wasn't even my guy. People don't know I had my guy already. I could have easily faded down the sideline, running with my guy as the quarterback was dropping back to release the ball, but as I'm running and checking my guy, I see my teammate getting beat. My guy who I told in the tunnel, hey man, if you get beat, I got your back. And I knew my teammate probably would have caught the guy if he would have caught the ball because my teammate, he went on to be a first round, 10 pick, multi-million dollar guy, went on to play for the Patriots. So I knew he was a pretty talented guy and he probably would have caught the guy and tackled him. But I told him, hey man, if you get beat, I got your back. And it just so happened, a play unfolded with a little bit over two minutes left in the game to where my guy, now he was getting beat. And I'm fading off on my guy, but I see the quarterback, he was releasing the ball to the guy that was beating my teammate. And I said, man, I gotta go, I gotta have his back. And I go up and I roll up and I go to hit this guy to end the game. This tackle probably would have ended the game if I'd have hit him and caught him the right way. If I'd have hit him and caught him how I really wanted to catch him, it probably would have ended the game and I would have made him fumble because I knew the game of football like you guys know the furniture business. I knew it in and out. Like a guy take two steps off the line of scrimmage, I could tell you which way he was going. A guy would cut inside, I could tell you it's only about three things he can do out of this formation. Like I knew it in and out. And so I knew if I'd have caught him in the right location at the right time, I'd have popped that ball out. But it didn't work like that. I hit him and as soon as I hit him, it seemed as if every breath in my body left. I lost control of my body. Never happened to me before. Body went completely limp. Seemed as if every breath in my body left. I'm, I'm falling to the ground. Like, man, what's happening? And I black out. As soon as I hit the ground, I black out. Never happened to me before. And I black out, I come back to, my teammates run over to me. Hey, Ink, get up, man, let's rock, let's go. I said, I can't. I said, what do you mean you can't? You always get up, get up, let's roll. So I can't move. So there's a shot going from my neck to my toe. I can't feel anything. The shock eventually left and it stayed in my right arm and hand. I remember as I was lying there, they were bringing the spine board out 
They put me up on the spine board, and as they're willing me off the field, I looked up to the sky and said, surely nothing is happening in this moment that can alter my life. This is what I love to do. They get me over to the ambulance. They said, man, we're going to take you to the hospital, run some CAT scans. We'll bring you back into your room. We'll tell you what's up. I said, all right, cool. They take me in the room. They run CAT scans. They bring me back into another room. And when they put me into the room in my hospital bed, my mother comes in. She kisses me. She prays for me. And as she's going to walk out, doctors rush in from the opposite side as my mother is walking out. And when my mother told me, son, you'll be all right, it was a certain element of peace attached to it because I have been with my mother my whole life. Me and my father, our relationship was pretty much a business relationship. Early years, he wasn't there. When I started playing sports, he came along in the picture, but I needed him to get out of my situation, right? And so we had a business relationship. But when my mother said something to me, I had been rocking with my mother since I was 16. I had Miss Mills with my mother since, I was, since she was 16, I mean. And so when she said it would be okay, I was like, all right, cool. And as she's going to walk out, doctors running in, they say, hey guys, get in here. We gotta rush him back to surgery. He's about to die. I said, it's a new ball game. Like I was a part of the football game, but this, this is a new game. I said, die. He said, yeah, man, you busted up your clavian artery in your chest. You're bleeding internally. Gotta rush you back, take that main vein out of your left leg, plug it into your chest in order to save your life. We don't have much time. Next morning, I wake up from recovery. He said, Inky, I got some good news and some bad news. Good news, we saved your life. I said, thank you. Bad news is you got nerve damage in your right shoulder. I said, all right, cool. He said, we got to send you up to the Mayo Clinic, Rochester, Minnesota. I said, all right, cool. He said, but the problem is, you know that dream of going to the NFL? I said, yes, sir. I'm close. He said, strong possibility. You probably can never play the game of football another day in your life. I said, no way. I said, um, I, don't, I don't know if you know how hard I work for this. Like, I don't know if you know, I've been working since I was seven years old. Like, I didn't start out playing football saying, man, I just want to go to the NFL to make it. Yeah, I want to go to the NFL to take care of my family, give back to my community. But the way in which I started playing a game, I started playing in the street, and I would be bloody. My mother didn't even sign me up to play. The first white guy I ever met in my life signed me up to play football. A guy riding down the street in a blue pickup truck. Never forget it. My God, love him to death. Pulling down the street in a blue pickup truck, pulls on the curb, steps out of his truck, walks up in the middle of our game. I'm standing there bloody, tackle football in the street. Guy walks up, Trey Hurst, never forget it. My uncle's on the corner, they're drug dealers, in prison right now. They take off running. My uncle Bobo serving 40 years in the federal penitentiary. He looks back, he said, Inky, don't talk to him. He thinking the guy's the cop, Coach Trey, nicest guy in the world. Walks up, he said, man, would you kids like to play football on grass? I said, man, I would love that. He said, he said, go in the house and get one of your guardians. I ran in the house, my uncle JJ had married into the family. I said, hey, unk, man, it's a guy outside. Will you please come and talk to him? Uncle said, sure. Uncle comes outside, Coach Trey said, listen. He said, I don't even supposed to be over here. He said, I brought a kid home. His mom asked me, could I bring him home? I brought him home. And he said, I rode down the street. I see these kids playing football in the street. They're bloody. He said, you could bring him across town, I got a lead, y'all can sign him up, I think it'll be a great opportunity for him. My uncle said, sir, we greatly appreciate it, I hate to tell you, we don't have the money. And I'm standing in front of him because I really want to play, and he said, I hate to tell you, but his mother, he said, she definitely doesn't have the money, she's at work at Wendy's right now. I'll never forget that coach looked at my uncle, he said, I tell you what, he said, y'all bring him to the park, he said, here's the address. I said, not only will I sign that kid up, I said, I'll sign every kid in this street up and play. They brought us to the park the next day. He signed every last one of us up, and it changed the trajectory of my life. You know, the second person I saw in the hospital after they saved my life, that coach that signed me up to play ball when I was seven years old, crying on my mother's shoulder. You know, the person my mother called on Christmas when me and my family got robbed, they put a nine millimeter and a 45 in my face when I was 15 years old. That coach that signed me up to play ball when I was seven years old. And so what I was telling the doctor was, Doc, I got to give some people a return on their investment. Like, this can't stop right now. And I'll never forget, I said to him, I said, I never cheated. I said, I never cheated. I was taught, you work for something, the result will be what you want it to be. Like, I never cheated. Like, nobody had to worry about me cutting corners. Like a coach could give me a workout, I'll go do it. If my teammate would try to cheat, sometimes I'll complete my guy's workout. 
Like I never, I never, I never believed in it, right? Because I knew every time I cheated, it was a possibility and an opportunity for me to become weaker. And so I never believed in cheating. I never believed in the mentality behind cutting corners and not facing a challenge. Because I understood if it didn't challenge me, it wouldn't change me. I said, man, send me up to the Mayo. My, my career can't be over. I work too hard. And I go up in the Mayo Clinic, and I'll never forget. I walk in the room, and there's three doctors. And they come in, and they say, hey, Inc., here's the deal. We're going to cut to the chase. They said, um, you have torn all the nerves in your brachial plexus. I said, what's that? They said, it's the nerve roots that go from your spine and controls your shoulder, your arm, and your hand. So it goes into your spine like this, you rip them all out, they can't go back in. They said, we hate to tell you, but football career, it's out of here. They say your shoulder, your arm, your hand, never be the same again. They say, here are your surgery options, Inc. We could take a muscle, back of your left leg, plug it into your right arm, possibility, weak left leg, weak right arm the rest of your life. We could take a nerve out of your left arm, reroute it up to your chest, down to your right arm, possibility, two weak arms the rest of your life. We could take a nerve out of your left rib, reroute it up to your chest, down to your right arm, possibility, breathing problem, weak right arm the rest of your life. By the way, tell us what you want to do at 8 o'clock in the morning. Next morning, I walked into the office. They said, what option did you choose? I said, no disrespect to you. Cut me where you got to cut me. I guarantee you, if I don't die, I'll be fine. They said, you got to choose an option. I said, no disrespect to you. Cut me where you got to cut me. I guarantee you, if I don't die, I'll be fine. And what I was telling them was, Doc, you got to take my life before you take my drive, man. I'm not a light switch person. Like, I don't turn it on and turn it. Like, I could play you in checkers. I'm going to try to destroy you. Like, I could play you in a game of, you know, little pitch and hold, a little thing. I'm going to try to destroy you. That's just my mentality of just going all in and everything that I do. And what I was telling them, you can cut me wherever you got to cut me. If you don't kill me, you will not stop me because I know my mentality and I know the way I'm wired. I don't turn it on and turn it off. But as life would have it, they cut me six times down my left eye. One time across the left side of my neck, one time across the right side, twice to my right ribs, cut out my right pec, bottom of my armpit, bottom of my hand, 350 staples in my body, bandaged me from my neck to my knees. And they come in my room the next day, they said, Inky, we're going to get to know each other really well. You'll be in this hospital next 40 or 60 days. On the third day, we were leaving the hospital. And as we're leaving and the doors were opening, he said, you broke a record. How did you do it? He said, nobody has ever gotten out of here in under less than 40 days with a surgery of that magnitude. I said, uh, Doc, I just didn't feel as if I had to write. He said, what are you talking about, I had to write? I said, um, I just didn't feel as if I had the right to stop. Like, I, I just didn't feel as if I had the right not to show up and give everything up. Like, I just didn't feel as if I had the right to not press forward. Like, I just felt as if the people that I represent and the people that had invested in me and built the, the, the gentleman that you see called Inky, it's a lot of people that go into the, like, when they were out there telling me, man, I admire what you've been through. I admire the place you've gotten to in life. And I told them, I said, there was a lot of people that helped me. And I take those spirits with me every day, like, uh, Maya Angelou has a quote that says, I come as one, but I stand as 10,000. Meaning I had made a vow to a lot of people. I had made vows to a lot of people about what I would do and what I would represent. And when I tell somebody something, I don't take that lightly. Like if I tell you, I'm going to give you everything I got, you can bet your bottom dollar, I'm going to give you everything I got. If we're walking somewhere and we end up in an alley and 10 people come in the alley and they're trying to rob us and I tell you, hey brother, we're getting home, we're getting home. And I'm not running. My word, it means something, and whatever I got to go through and accept and be a part of in order to make it happen, I'm willing to go through. I'm committed to every single aspect of my life. And I was taught commitment is staying true to what you said you would do long after the mood that you said it in has left. Because we say things when the mood is right, right? But when the environment and the mood changes, we, we back off of it. But I have made a vow to a lot of people, not only my teammates, I made a vow to everybody that had ever invested in me in my life that I would finish what I started and I would complete my mission every single day. And by completing my mission in life every single day, I mean I will empty my bucket and give every aspect of my life every single bit of Inky Johnson. I may be crazy, I don't know, but I just believe my five-year-old son and my six-year-old daughter, they deserve the best version of me. I may be crazy, I don't know, but I just believe my wife that I've been with ever since we were in the fifth grade, she deserves the best version of me. I may be crazy, I don't know, but my three little sisters, I just believe they deserve the best version of their big brother. I may be crazy, I don't know, but the people I'm of service to on the face of this planet, they deserve the best version of me, and I'm not going to give them any less.
See, the thing I understand about business, I might not know more, more, much about the furniture business, but I know a lot about the people's business. And I know every single day, the people that come across our paths, whether we're doing business with them, whether we're talking to them about any aspect of life, I know they're coming across our path for a reason. And I'm gonna try my best to leave them a little bit different. The only reason I kept pressing forward, the only reason I didn't stop was because everybody that I met and everybody I came across, I knew they were looking at my perspective about life. And if I can keep pressing forward, they may encounter something that they may face and they want to stop. And the first person that will pop up in their mind, man, if ink pressed forward and ink kept going, surely I can do it. And so the next week I was back at practice with my teammates, my guys that I worked with. My guys that we went through the struggle with, my guys that we cracked jokes with, my guys we got knocked out with, my guys that we went to war with, my guys that I would give everything for them. I was back at practice in the sand pit with a Dunjoy sling and I still had my staples in my body. I was back in class the next week, got my undergrad degree in three years when my life changed overnight. I never stopped. I never missed a beat and my life changed. And people ask me all the time, how did you keep pressing forward? Like the video that you all saw, I want to give you the backdrop to how it happened. ESPN called me. They did a story on me this past summer. But they called me one day, and I picked up the phone. They said, is this Inky Johnson? I said, last time I checked, I'm Inky Johnson. <laughs> they said, is this the same guy that said, if you could change what happened to you, you wouldn't? I said, absolutely. They said, it's our understanding the game of football meant the world to you. I said, at one point, it did. They said, it's our understanding that your family was banking on you making it to the NFL so they can have a better way of life. I said, yep, yeah, that's, that's correct. They said, we're coming to see you. I said, all right, cool, come on. They said, but we don't want to see you in Atlanta. We want to see you in Neyland Stadium on the exact yard line where your life changed. The same time of day. The only thing that won't be present is Air Force's team. I said, all right, cool. And so they take me to Neyland Stadium, they put me on the exact yard line when my life changed. They said, now tell your younger self why you wouldn't stop your injury if you could. If you could be in the NFL right now making millions of dollars, tell your younger self why you wouldn't change that situation if you could. And I say, the reason I wouldn't change it, believe it or not, it has nothing to do with me. Like on a personal level, you, he thought I was going to say, because of the man that I've become, the perspective that I've acquired, my faith has been fortified. He thought I was going to say something like that. I said, no, it has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with the lives that have been affected by the result of the process and the thing that I represent in the world. What my spirit represents when somebody see me, they think perseverance. What my spirit represents when somebody see me, they think don't quit. What my spirit represents when somebody see me, they think it's a, it's a, it's, that's a quality individual right there. What my character represents in the world. And every single day we're putting something out like that represents something. When people see that, they think it's a thought that comes to the mind. When he said gold standard, he gave me that. I felt a certain type of way. When he gave me the gold standard, I felt a certain type. I felt different. Gold standard. I, I, I felt like that went with me. Because I think in what I do, the line of business I'm in, I'm the gold standard. Because I don't compromise. And every single day, I'm going to give you my very best. You can bet your bottom dollar. Every single day, I'm going to bring that gold standard to life. And I'm not just bringing it in one aspect of life. I'm bringing it in every single aspect of life. I'm not going to be one of these people in the world that's a public success, but they're a private failure. Meaning they give everything they got to one aspect of life, but the other areas, they lack off. No, I'm going to give every single thing I got to every aspect of my life because I represent something. When people see me, they think something. Whether that's character, never giving up, never surrendering. And the thing that we can never do is forget what we represent. Because that's how guys end up on the bridge on a cardboard box sleep. They forget what they represent when life hits them with adversity. My only charge for you, never forget what you represent. Life is short. Let's enjoy it while we got it. I was an underdog. I could play a little bit, but I was an underdog for the most part. But as I stand right here on this stage before you tonight, you know, a lot of thoughts come to mind. You know, first and foremost, I, I think about my life and I think about adversity and I think about opposition, but for the most part of my life, I've been on this quest to figure out how can I work hard for something and my performance is not based upon the outcome. 
How can I work and my, my effort and my motivation and my drive is not based upon what the product will be, but more so based upon me taking pride in what I do. And so I came up with this thing called process over product and I firmly believe the process saved my life. And what I mean by the process, I'm talking about the way I handle my business on a daily basis and the way I go about every single aspect of my life. I live by this thing called empty the bucket. And when people hear it, they think it's a cute slogan, empty the bucket, but what they don't understand, it's an unspoken law, empty the bucket, it's an unspoken law of accountability and responsibility to me on this earth and my existence and everybody that is connected to me. I may be crazy, but I don't know. I just believe that I'm supposed to give everybody that is connected to me the best version of me. I just believe I deserve to give my wife and my children the best version of me. I just believe the people that I'm a service to on this earth, I deserve to give them the best version of me. You see, the thing about chasing a product, and what the product is, the product is money. The product is a house, the product is a car. The thing about chasing a product, the product can always change. And if your performance is always based upon the product, what happens when the products change and you don't take pride in what you do? But the thing about loving the process, everybody wants the prize, but nobody loves the process. Everybody wants to be a champion, but nobody's willing to put in the work that it takes to be a champion. Everybody wants to hold up the trophy and say, man, I did it, but nobody's willing to put in the work that it takes to do it. I love the process. I love the thought of working for what I want. And I firmly believe you're never supposed to wish for it more than you're willing to work for it. Your expectations never supposed to exceed your effort. But a lot of people, they wish, and they're not willing to work. And the great thing about life, life has a funny way of testing all of us and seeing how bad we really want what it is that we say we want. Because the thing I know about people, people can talk to talk. And people do it very well. But life is going to hit you with a certain level of opposition. Life is going to hit you with a certain level of adversity. And life is going to say to you, you said you wanted it, now let's see how bad you really want it. But the great thing about it, if you love the process, when opposition and adversity hits, you will have a way of embracing it and using it, not only for yourself, but you will use it to make everybody that's connected to you stronger because your vision has to be larger than yourself. If everything that you do is just about you and for your personal gain, something's gonna come up against you that's gonna be a lot tougher than you. And if it's just about you, the moment you hit it, you're gonna quit and give up every time. But I believe in giving the backstory because I think the backstory shapes and molds situations and circumstances. And so I have to give you the backstory of what shaped and molded me into the man that I am today. I'm 29 years old. My mother got pregnant with me at 15 years old. I grew up on the east side of Atlanta, about five minutes away from where the Atlanta Braves play, in a neighborhood by the name of Kirkwood. Drugs, gangs, violence, you name it. And I came up in a two bedroom home, 14 people. And I used to sleep on the floor. My grandmother, Miss Daisy Johnson, she used to come to us and she would say, one night out of the week, you all get the opportunity to sleep in the bed. And so when I got to sleep in the bed, it wasn't like I got the bed to myself. And I was like, man, I got the bed to myself. It was five more of my cousins in the bed. And so we slept three to the foot and three at the head. And so as a kid, pretty quick, I had to make a decision of what I wanted to do with my life because in that same house, I had eight uncles, all eight of which are still going in and out of prison till this day because they sold drugs and they were in gangs. And so I looked at it, and it's kind of like that quote that says, learn from the mistakes of other people because you can't make them all yourself. And so I saw them selling drugs, but I also saw the outcome. And so I said, I'm not selling drugs. I'm not joining a gang because I see what that role leads to. Either I'm going to end up dead or in prison. I said, so my best bet may be to go to the NFL. And so I went to my cousin by the name of Taman. I said, listen, man, I want to go to the NFL. I feel our family deserves a better way of life. Let's work for it. I said, we're going to be patient. We're going to engage in consistent action every night. And so every night we would go out and we would race light pole to light pole in Kirkwood. No shoes. Light pole to light pole every night. And so one night we were getting ready to race and down the street came a big blue pickup truck. And it pulled over to the side and out of it got a white guy. First white guy I ever saw in my life. True story. And my uncle Bobo, who just got sentenced to 40 years in prison, he was on one corner. My other uncle Johnny, he was on the other corner. My uncle Bobo took off running and he looked at me, he said, Ink, don't talk to him. Saying to me, that guy has to be the police. 
Coach Trey walked up to us, nicest guy in the world. He said, would you kids like to play organized sports? I stepped to the front, I said, yes, sir. He said, go in the house and get your guardian. My uncle JJ was there, I went in the house, I said, uncle, there's a guy outside. He asked me like to play organized sports. I told him yes. He said, well, I go in the house to get my guardian. I'm coming to get you. Will you please talk to him? My uncle said, sure. My uncle walked outside. Coach Trey said, would you like to sign these kids up for organized sports? My uncle said, yes, sir, but I hate to tell you, we don't have the money. He said, don't worry about the money. You get them to the park and I'll take care of it. That same guy still buys me drawers and socks until this day on Christmas, and I'm 29 years old, and he started when I was seven. But a weird thing happened one night. You see, most nights after practice, everybody would leave to go home, and I always had to sit in the park because my mother worked at Wendy's. And my mother didn't get off work till about 10 o'clock, 10.30 most nights, and I'll be sitting there in the park, and I loved it. I didn't want anybody to take me home because when I went home, I was sleeping on the floor with roaches and rats. And so anytime I got in solitude to dream, anytime I got in solitude to think about what I wanted to do for my family and my community, I took advantage of it. And so most nights, I'll be sitting there in the park, and I'll be looking up at the lights. And I'll be envisioning myself doing things in the NFL, envisioning myself doing things for my community. And just as the lights would always go out, my mother, she would pull up and she used to drive an old Buick Regal. Hubcaps off the car seats, torn up, the car was all beat up. And she would pull up and she would put the car in park. And I would always hop up, I would run over to my mother, I would give her a hug and a kiss. And I would say, Mom, if you don't mind, can you please sit back in your car? I have to do some extra drills, I have to go to the NFL. She would never have to work another day in your life. And I knew she was tired. And every night my mother would say, sure, Ink, and she would sit back in that car, those car lights would hit that field, and here you had a seven-year-old kid doing backpedaling drills, running sprints, running laps, chasing his dream to go to the NFL. And just beyond those car lights, I could always connect with my mother's eyes. And so it made me dig a little bit deeper, it made me push myself a little bit further, it made me work a little bit harder. I live by this thing called the harder you work, the harder it is to surrender. You see, the reason people quit, they don't take pride in what they do. The harder you work, the harder it is to surrender. And I'm not just talking about business, I'm talking about winning simultaneously in every aspect of life. I'm not concerned with a person that does well in one aspect of their life and they can hang their hat there and say, man, I made a lot of money, you made a lot of money, you're a public success, but you're a private failure. What good is it to make a lot of money and you don't wanna go home to your family? What good is it to make a lot of money and you don't take care of your kids? What good is it? You're a public success, but you're a private failure. And so how can we win simultaneously and take pride in everything that we do? And one night, my mother couldn't pick me up and she called Coach Trey. She said, Coach, I can't make it tonight. Can you please take Inky home? And so he put me and about eight guys in the back of his pickup truck. And he said, Inky, I'm going to drop you off last. And so when he got to my house, I got out on the sidewalk. And I'm, I'm standing in front of 125 Warren Street. And I look back at Coach Trey. And I said, why? Why are you doing this? Because where I came from, people didn't just help you. It was, I pat you on your back, you gotta pat me on my back. You remember I did that for you, you gotta do this for me. And I said, why are you doing this? And he looked back at me and he said, son, son I wanna tell you something. And he said, I don't want you to ever forget it. He said, son, the more you make sure that somebody else's life is okay, God will always make sure that your life is okay. And immediately I got it. The light bulb went off. I stopped being this little selfish kid. I stopped being like my four-year-old son. And for the first time in my life, I stopped thinking everything was just about Inky Johnson. And I realized my existence on this earth is a lot bigger than me. I realized me, my lineage and my family, when I step outside of my door in the morning, what I represent is a lot bigger than me. And so the thing I had to understand, every day I woke up and everything that I was a part of, I first had to understand I was representing a lot more than myself. I first had to start living by two words, honor and legacy. And what I mean by honor and legacy, you honor the ones that paved the way for you and you leave a legacy for the ones that's coming behind you. We just have it right now while we're a part of something right now. Somebody has came before us and paid the way and somebody will come after us. And so while we have it, how can we do it in such a way that we leave a legacy for the ones that's coming behind us and we honor the ones that paid the way for us. And so everything I did, I took a certain level of pride in it. People thought I just wanted to be a great football player. What they didn't understand about Inky Johnson was this, I could have washed cars. I guarantee you, I would have been the best car washer there was in the world. Because the thing I understood, I wasn't just representing myself. 
It wasn't just about me. Everything that I did, I shifted my mindset from me to we. Now I was operating with a spirit of collective character, meaning it didn't matter what I did individually. If I didn't represent my mother in the right way, it didn't matter. If I didn't represent my lineage in the right way, if I didn't represent my team in the right way, who cares what I did individually? I didn't care if we won a game and I scored 40 points individually. Who cared? I shifted from me to we. And so everything I started to do, I was thinking about my family, I was thinking about my community, and I was thinking about my friends in a different way. And I will never forget, I got to high school. And nobody in my family had ever been to college. They all dropped out, ended up in prison. My high school, the name of it was Crim High School in Atlanta. They used to call it Crime High. They used to shoot teachers. And my first day, I walked through the metal detector. And a cop was standing on the other end of the metal detector. And he said, what is your plan, little man? I said, my plan is to go to Division I. He said, no, you'll probably go to cell block D1. I said, no, you got the wrong block. He said, I heard that before. Your uncles came through and said the same thing. I said, no, I'm telling you, you got the wrong guy. You know the first person I went to see when I got my scholarship papers? <laughs> but you know the most amazing thing happened? It wasn't that I went to college. I had three little cousins sleeping on that same floor that went to college. I saw friends in my community come off the corner from selling drugs and go to college. I saw friends in my community come out of games and go to college. All because I shifted my mindset and it wasn't about me. I broke generational curses in my community because it wasn't just about me. I didn't care so much about me going to college. I wanted the ones coming behind me to get it. And I'll never forget, I went on an airplane, and my first time riding an airplane, I was a senior going to a football game, and I went in the restroom on an airplane, and as I was washing my hands, there was a sign on the wall. And I'll never forget it. My first time on the airplane, I'm washing my hands, there was a sign on the wall. And as I was walking out of the restroom, the sign said, as common courtesy to the person that's coming behind you, can you wipe the sink out and leave it better than you found it? And I said, as common courtesy to the generation that is coming behind me in life, everything that I touch, everything that I'm a part of, I vow to God that I will leave it better than I found it. And so now it wasn't even about me. And I got my scholarship up to Tennessee and they looked at me when I first hit campus, 135 pound kids soaking wet in the SEC. And the first reporter, he asked me, he said, Inky Johnson, do you even think you're gonna play at the University of Tennessee? He said, you're 135 pounds. I said, not only am I gonna play, I'm gonna start. I said, you made a mistake. I said, see what you don't understand and this is what most people do. They base judgment off of what they can see. But what they don't understand, the moments that make you who you are, the moments that they can't see. You see, anybody can be on their best behavior when somebody is standing over their shoulder, watching them, seeing if they're gonna do what they're supposed to do. But what they're reporting and see, you see, he could see I came from Crim High School, he could see I was 135 pounds, he could see I was 5'9", he could see all of the stats, he could see all of that. But what he never saw was when I was in a park with my mother when I was seven years old, she was sitting at Beer Rico at 10.30 at night. What he didn't see was every Saturday morning at 5.30, I was up running two miles to a fire station and two miles back home. What he didn't see was every time I slept on that floor with ropes and rats with my cousins, I got up every morning, went to school, and never made one excuse. What he didn't see was on Christmas Eve when a, cop, when a guy came through me and my cousin's window, and he stuck a 9 millimeter and a 45 in both our face and took all of our Christmas gifts, and we had to stand on the curb, and our mother told us, y'all just be grateful. He didn't see that. And those were the moments that made me who I am. And so now his opinion didn't matter. His opinion would never become my reality. And my freshman year, I played special teams. Sophomore season came, broke the starting lineup. You know the first person I went to see at media day? He quit. He was so embarrassed. And I'll never forget my sophomore season, I finally made it to the point in my life where I felt as if everything in my life was lining up. Spiritually, I was getting discipled. Life was in shape. On track to graduate in three years, life was in shape, education. 
I still remember the day I was in the film room watching film and I was watching the California Bears and my defensive backs coach Larry Slade came in the room. He said, Inky Johnson, I got some good news for you. And I dropped the clicker and I said, coach, what is it? He said, son, you're a projected top 30 draft pick. He said, all you have to do is play these next 10 football games. You're an automatic multimillionaire. I ran out of the room. I got on the phone. I called my mother and my grandmother. I said, listen, I said, after this season, we will never struggle. I said, we would never miss another meal. I said, after this season, our lives are about to change forever. And little did I know our lives were really about to change. First game we come out, play against California Bears, I get an interception, we shut them down, we get the victory. Second game, we're playing against Air Force, it gets late in the game, found ourselves in a dogfight. Quarterback dropped back, he released the ball to the running back coming down my sideline. Now I approach the tackle like I approach any other tackle, and the way I'm approaching it, either I'm going to knock you out or you're going to knock me out. I'm 165 pounds. I can't play with anybody. But at the point of contact, when I hit this guy, something different happened that had never happened to me before in my life. I hit him, and it seemed as if every breath in my body left. My body went completely limp. I fell to the ground. I blacked out. I'll never forget when my eyes opened, my teammates ran over to me. My first guy that was over was Gerard Mayo, the middle linebacker for the Patriots, one of my best friends. And he said, Ink, get up, let's go. I said, I can't. He said, what do you mean you can't? You're out of lockdown corner, we need you, let's go. I said, I can't move. I said, there's a shock going through my whole body. I can't feel anything, man. One of the scariest moments of my life and the shock eventually left and it stayed in my right arm and hand. And I remember as I was lying there, I flipped my head to the left and I could see the doctors and the trainers running onto the field and I flipped my head up to the sky and I said, God, I said, surely nothing has happened in this moment that can alter my life. I flipped my head back over to the left and they were bringing the spine board out. I flipped my head up to the sky, I said, God, I said, that's precautionary measures, right? They get me up on the spine board, they're wheeling me off the field, and I looked at the doctor because I couldn't feel my right arm. They had poked me with all type of needles. Inky, can you feel this? Can you feel I couldn't feel a thing. And I said, Doc, can you, can you lift my right arm and hand? He said, sure, Inky, and he raised it up, and I, I lifted my left. And I pumped it to our supporters. I don't believe in using the word fans. I think it's an arrogant term. Who am I to call a person a fan? They pay to see you play. They're supporting you. And as he was bringing my arm down, I looked at the doctor. I said, oh, yeah. I said, I'll be back. Never thinking that would be the last game that I would ever play in my life. They get me in the ambulance. Things turn up a notch. I still don't pay it any mind. They get me over to the hospital. They say, Inky, we're going to take you back and run some CAT scans. They took me back. They ran the CAT scans, and they rolled me back into my room, and I'll never forget it. All in about a 15-second time frame, I was lying there in my bed, and I could see over my right shoulder. And I looked at my father, and we caught eyes, and my father, he went to take a step in, and he looked at me, and he said, son, I can't do it. And he walked out. My mother, she came in. She was running. She kissed me on my forehead. She said a prayer. She said, Ink, everything is going to be OK. And she ran out. And as soon as my mother stepped outside of the room, the doctor rushed in from the opposite side. And he said, hey, get in here. We got to rush this guy back to emergency surgery. He's about to die. I said, what? I said, my mom just told me everything was going to be OK. Like, this is total opposite. You're talking about I'm about to die. I said, what happened? He said, son, what happened? You have busted up some clavian artery in your chest. You're bleeding internally. I have to rush you back and take the main vein out of your left leg and plug it into your chest in order to save your life. And when I woke up from recovery, the same doctor was standing over me. He said, Inky, I have some good news and some bad news for you. I said, you got some bad news for me? I have to tell him I was about to die. I'm still alive. How bad can it get? I'm still here. He said, the good news is, son, we saved your life. I said, thank you, sir. He said, the bad news is you have nerve damage in your right shoulder. I said, cool. He said, we got to send you up to the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. I said, cool. He said, but the problem is, Inc., you probably can never play the game of football again in your life. I said, no way. He said, yeah, Inc., you got some pretty bad nerve damage. I said, no. I said, Doc, no disrespect, man, but I'm, I'm eight games away. Like, Doc, no disrespect, but this is about to change my family's life. Doc, I've been working for this ever since I was seven years old. Doc, there's no way. God, not now, God. Like, let me make it to the NFL so I can help my family first. Like, have you, we miss meals. And you're talking about my career could end right now? Like, no way. And I snapped out of it. I said, man, I never cheated. I said, there's no way. I never cheated. I never cheated myself. I gave everything I had to it, and I respected it. I never cheated. There's no way that my career can be over. I said, send me up to the Mayo Clinic. 
And after several visits, I'll never forget, this is when reality set in. It was me, my mother, my father in the room, and the doctors came in. They said, Inky Johnson, here's the deal. They said, son, you have torn all the nerves in your brachial plexus. They said, your brachial plexus are the nerve roots that go from your spine, and they come down, they control your shoulder, your arm, and your hand. They said, you have torn them at all levels. They cannot be replugged. It says, son, we hate to tell you, but your arm, it would never be the same again. Your hand, it would never be the same again. Son, you can never play the game of football again. It says, son, here are your surgery options. We could take a muscle out of the back of your left leg, plug it into your right arm, but there's a possibility that you'll be left with a weak left leg and a weak right arm the rest of your life. Or we could take a nerve out of your left arm, reroute it up to your chest, down into your right arm, but there's a possibility that you'll be left with two weak arms the rest of your life. Or we could take a nerve out of your left rib, reroute it up to your chest, down into your right arm, but there's a possibility that you'll be left with a breathing problem and a weak right arm the rest of your life. By the way, tell us what you want to do in the morning. And the next morning, I walked into the doctor's office. They said, son, what option did you choose? I said, no disrespect to you, doc. I'm not choosing an option. My situation is out of your hands. It said, cut with the cute talk. I said, no disrespect to you, doc. Cut me where you gotta cut me. My situation is out of your hands. I'm not choosing an option. I said, I know I will come out of this situation okay. And as I stand right here on this stage, thank you. As I stand right here on this stage before you today, they cut me six times down my left thigh. They cut me two times across my right rib. They cut me two times across my right pec. They cut me one time across the left side of my neck, one time across the right side of my neck. They cut me from the bottom of my armpit all the way down to the bottom of my hand. And after they got through cutting on me, they said, son, you're gonna be in this hospital for the next 40 days. I walked out of the hospital on the third day. They said, you broke a record. How did you do it? And I said, first and foremost, the thing I want y'all to understand, I would never let a circumstance or a situation define my life. But most importantly, you know what I had invested? I had sweat equity. I had been working my whole life. And what I didn't understand by being determined to chase something, by being committed to it, and what commitment is, commitment is staying true to what you said you were going to do long after the mood that you have set it in has left. You see, people think commitment is saying, yes, I'll do it on the days when it feel good. But I have been committed to everything that I ever started in my life, and I never stopped, and I never quit it. And so by being committed to everything that I started, I finished it. It built a certain type of spirit. It built a certain type of mentality. It built a certain type of individual. And so now I couldn't quit even if I wanted to. I couldn't lay in the bed even if I wanted to. I couldn't stop even if I wanted to. I had too much sweat equity in my life and everything that I was doing. Because I understood my existence wasn't about me. I went from me to we a long time ago. I understood the process is more important than the product. It wasn't about the outcome for me. Whether I made it to the NFL or not, that was inconsequential in God's plan for my life. But I was going to fall in love with that process because I understood by falling in love with that process, it was going to turn me into a machine. You see, a lot of people need things to get motivated. A lot of people need a little extra money to get motivated. A lot of people need, you know, whatever the case may be, a little bonus to get motivated. I don't need anything but breath in my body and life. And every day I wake up, I understand I got two children depending on me. I understand I got a wife depending on me. I understand I got a world that needs me. The reason I go at life with the passion and the zeal that I go at it with is because I understand every day of my life is somebody in the world that is depending on me. It may not be you, and if it's just about you, you're in trouble because I'm telling you, you're going to hit something in life that's a lot tougher than you, and it's going to test your will, and it's going to test your heart. And if it's just about you, and if it's just about the product, it will crush you. Every day I get up, I understand. It's somebody in a free world that's looking at me to see if I'm going to keep going. And so I can't quit. And so I went back to school the next week after they had just saved my life. I was back in class. I had to learn how to write all over again. I had to learn how to walk all over again. I had to learn how to tie my shoe all over again. I had to learn how to bathe all over again. I had to learn how to live life all over again. Never one time did I say, let me go home. I need a break. Never one time did I go into the training room and said, I need some time off. Can you all just give me a little leave time? I need to go back home. I need some time off. My life just changed last week. 
And they came to me and they said, Inky, go home. We know how much the game of football meant to you. I said, yeah, you know how much the game of football meant to me, but you don't know how much life means to me. You see, the thing we have to understand about everything that we're a part of, first and foremost, it's a blessing by God. And when it's a blessing, you can't help but to give everything you got to it. My life got saved. I got spared my life. I almost died. The doctor came to me on the field. He was on one knee and he grabbed my wrist and he said, son, you don't have a pulse. I don't even know how you're still living. And my last doctor visit, they came to me and they said, sorry, Inky Johnson, you will never be able to use this arm and hand again in your life. I said, no disrespect to you, doc, but I will use this arm and this hand every day for the rest of my life by the way that I live my life. Every day, I'm going to impact someone's life. Every day, I'm going to empower someone. Every day, I'm going to inspire someone. Every day, I'm going to encourage someone. The thing we have to understand, what business are we in? You know, protocol, they call me in the world, they say Inky's a speaker. Inky's a motivational, whatever the case may be, Inky, whatever, whatever it is. But what they don't understand, I'm in the people's business. Not a speaker, I'm a servant. Anybody that has direct contact with people on a daily basis, that is an opportunity to change someone's life. Don't ever pass up an opportunity to be of encouragement to other people. Don't ever pass up an opportunity to inspire someone. Don't ever pass up an opportunity to empower someone. Don't ever pass up an opportunity to show someone love because the thing about it, my wound, like you can see this. You can see my arm. My wound is visible. But it's a lot of people in this room that are wounded and you can't see it. And it's internal. And so the, the opportunities that we pass up to be a blessing to other people, we can save their life with just one encounter. When we talk about me to we, when we talk about process over product, when we talk about sweat equity, when we talk about better together, do we really understand what that means? Because sometimes the thing about life, life always comes along when we make up our mind to try to distract us. But truth be told, we all know that we're stronger together. And that's in every aspect of life, whether it be sports, whether it be business, whether it be a marriage, whether it be a family, we're always stronger together. It's kind of like the Planet of the Apes movie when Caesar and his guys, they were going crazy, they were going bananas, and Caesar stood back on the hill, and Caesar was trying to calm them down, they wouldn't calm down, they wouldn't listen to him, and the way he got their attention was phenomenal. The way he got their attention, he picked up a piece of straw, one silly piece of straw. Caesar picked up one silly piece of straw and he, he held it up in front of him. He picked up one straw and he broke it. And then he picked up two hands full of straws and he braced it. And what he was telling them, along, we can do nothing. Together, strong, unstoppable, can change the world.
You know, as a kid, man, I was a visionary, but sometimes being a visionary was painful because I can always see what I wanted to go in my life. I can always see what I wanted to become, but I always had to come back and deal with the raw reality of life. And the raw reality of life is this, no matter what I did on the football field, no matter what I did on the basketball court, every night I came back to 125 Warren Street, I was sleeping on that floor with roaches and rats. And so sometimes it was painful. And so just about every night, my mother would pull into that park and she'd be driving this old beard regal, hubcaps off the car, seats all torn up, car was all beat up, but we loved that. All right, and my mother would put that car in park and I would hop up off that bench, I would sprint over to my mother, I would give her the biggest hug and the biggest kiss that I could give her. And I would say, Mom, if you don't mind, can you please sit back in your car and turn on your car lights? I have to do some extra drills, I have to go to the NFL. She would never have to work another day in your life. And I knew my mother was tired. But every night my mother would say, sure, eh? And she would get back in that Buick Regal and those car lights would hit that field where you had the seven-year-old kid doing backpelling drills, running sprints, running laps, chasing his dream to the NFL. That's why anytime a cat see me speak about the game of football, I can't hold the passion because it's real to me. You see, I was really in the park with my mother when I was seven years old. There was nobody out there but me, my mother, and God. And I was right there chasing the dream. My mother was sitting in a beard regal, and she had a car light. So that's why anytime I played the game, anytime I stepped in between the lines, I gave everything I had. It had nothing to do with Inky Johnson. It had nothing to do with the people in the stands. It had everything to do with my mother when I was seven years old. And she was sitting in that park with those car lights on. And she made a sacrifice for me that I had to honor for the rest of my life. You see, I'm one to honor sacrifice. I believe in that. When a person makes a sacrifice for your person, don't have to do that. You see, we live with this younger generation. I tell the younger generation they live in this Burger King society. They want to have it their way, right? And so they got the million dollar dream with the minimum wage work ethic. They missed it. Yeah, they got the million dollar dream with the minimum wage work ethic. Right? They want to wish for it more than they're willing to work for it. Want to hope for more than they're willing to work for. But the thing about it is, when you look at everything with a Colossians 3:23 mindset, and so what I mean by Colossians 3:23 mindset, and you can look at every aspect of life, whether it's your work, whether it's your family, whether it's your job, whatever it may be. If you look at everything with a Colossians 3:23 mindset, it makes everything have a purpose that's greater than yourself. And what Colossians 3:23 is, is I do everything as if I'm doing it for the Lord and not for man. And so now, when I do everything as if I'm doing it for the Lord and not for man, you don't matter anymore. Because people can say things to you that can hurt you. People can do things to you that can hurt you. But if my purpose is greater than you, it does not matter what you say to me. I'm operating with a purpose that's greater than myself. I'm operating with a purpose that's greater than you. And so now, every day I get up, I can't help but to give everything I got as a father. I can't help but to give everything I got as a husband. I can't help but to give everything I got as a man because I'm living with a purpose that's greater than myself. You see, a lot of people, they're moved. They're, 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 they're like a puppet. They're like a puppet and their boss is the puppet master. And so he might say something to you and you don't like it and it might mess up your whole day. Now you rude to your kids, now you rude to everybody you come in contact with. You got a coworker, they might say something to you, they're the puppet master. They playing with you, they playing with your emotion, they playing with your feelings, you ride an emotional roller coaster, they got you. Right? Because you don't have a purpose that's greater than any individual. And the moment you get a purpose that's greater than any individual, the way you live your life will totally change. The way you do things will totally change. Your perspective will totally change. The way you go about your business and life will totally change. That Colossians 3.23 is a cold thing. Because now everything you're involved in, you look at it totally different. And once you change your mind, you can change your life. The way you change when you look at things, the way you change when you speak about things, that changes your life. You see, a lot of people, they can't see things, right? They can't see things clearly. And so sometimes they can be in the midst of a situation, and all they have to do is get into that situation. All they have to do is look at that situation different. Meaning, when I was in that two-bedroom room, 14 individuals, yeah, every night I slept on the floor with ropes and rats. But every morning I would be at the bus stop with my cousins, and I would tell them, I would say, man, when I become a man, who will never sleep on the floor with ropes and rats? Because I didn't see my situation, I saw my destination. But I'll never forget, I prided myself on hard work. Because that was something that didn't cost me a thing. And every individual possess it, all they have to do is activate. And I'll never forget, I, I, I had my father, me and my father, we had a little strange relationship coming up. And what I mean by a strange relationship, I was that kid, I was growing up, and I had most of my uncles living in that two-bedroom home. So it was about eight of them, and eight of them, they were in and out of prison, they still are in and out of prison. 
You know, they're going in for 10, they're going in for eight, they're coming out, they're doing the same thing, they're going back to prison. And so I had my uncle and he showed me, he showed me lessons about hard work and he's about the only one, only one making an honest living and taking care of his family. And so I had my father and they told me, they said, man, your father, he's really good at sports. My father, his name is still not on my birth certificate until this day. And so they said, man, your father, he's really good at sports. And so I said, can you take me to meet him? I asked my uncle JJ, can you take me to meet my father? I want to meet him. He took me to meet him. I said, man, what's up, man? I heard you're pretty good at sports. And we started chopping it up for a little bit. I said, man, well, can you do this for me? Can you pick me up every Friday night after a game? And can you take me to your house to spend the night? And can we get up the next morning and you work me out? You can bring me back home Saturday. Can you do that? He said, I got you. He would pick me up on a Friday night and Saturday mornings we were up at 4.30 and we were running miles and miles to this fire station. And my father, at the time, my father didn't believe in God. My father had been mad at God his whole life because my father lost his mother when he was 14 years old to cancer. And so I'll never forget it, me and my pops would be out and we would run miles and miles to this fire station. And so one morning we got up and we got up at around four o'clock and back then I was a little younger, I didn't have to stretch as much. So I could get out, I could shake my legs out and we could take off. Now I can't do that. <laughs> but we'd get out there and we will get ready. And, and one morning he said, uh, he said, son, I need you to pull that other person outside of you. And he would always say it and so I would always give him a head nod and we would get ready to work because I love the process. I love the thought of getting up in the morning, chasing my goals and chasing my dreams. Their minds, I'm responsible for them not placing in anybody else's hands. If I want something, I'm willing to work for what I pray for. Yes. And so my father now to drag me out of the house. My father said, hey, get up now. I'm already at the line waiting on you. Let's go. And so he said, son, I want you to pull that other person outside of you today. And so I gave him a head nod. I said, yes, sir. And he didn't get beside me. He kept pacing in front of me. He said, son, I want you to pull that other person outside of you today. I said, yes, sir. Let's go kept pacing. Son, I need you to pull that other person outside of you there. So at this point, I'm frustrated. I step back. I said, what other person? I said, there's nobody else out here but me and you. It's pitch black. Nobody else out here. I don't see another person. I said, man, if you don't want to work, just tell me you don't want to work. I just take off by myself. You're trying to talk your way out of this thing. It's pitch black. It's dark. It's four o'clock in the morning. Let's go. Are you about to work or not? He don't know about to go or not. He said, Inky, I want you to hear me and I want you to hear me clearly. He said, son, no matter how hard you work, there's somebody inside of you that works even harder. He said, no matter how dedicated you are, there's somebody inside of you that's more dedicated. No matter how committed you are, there's somebody inside of you that's more committed. But here's the catch. I need you to pull that other person outside of you, not just in the game of football, not just in the things you like, not just in the things that are convenient. Son, I need you to pull that other person outside of you in every aspect of your life, meaning I need you to give everything you got to every aspect of your life because here's what's going to happen. One day you're going to hit a certain piece of opposition. One day you're going to hit a certain piece of adversity. One day you're going to hit a certain piece of trial and tribulation. And your strength alone won't do it. You will have to learn to pull from another place. You will have to have a greater purpose to why you do what you do. You have to have a greater source of inspiration and motivation and why you get up every day. And so if you give everything you got to everything you're involved in, you create a certain individual on the inside. And when you hit that opposition, you pull that other person out and you say, I'm not quitting. When you hit that trial and tribulation, you pull that other person out and you say, I'm not giving up. When you hit that trial and tribulation, you pull that other person out of you and you embrace it. And you not only use it to make you a better person, you use it to make everybody around you strong. You see, we live in a selfish world. We live in a selfish world to where people, if there's no benefit for them, they don't want nothing to do with it. And so they approach things with the mindset of, what's in it for me? What have you done for me lately? Instead of saying, man, I'm gonna just give everything I got. And it just might be a person over there that's watching to see how I'm gonna respond to this situation and it may just free that person. Yes. One of my greatest moments in life was when I was having a book signing and I'm up, I was backing up and I was about to leave and a guy, he came rushing in, he was running in, right? And so he's running in from the hood, so I don't know what he's about to try. So I'm backing up, you know, I got, I got one bad on, but I, I ain't scared to fight you with <laughs> Running there, so I backed up a little bit. And he stopped a couple feet away from me, breathing hard. I said, What's up, man? What's up? You doing all right? He said, Yeah, man, I'm good. I'm good. He said, Man, I just want to tell you something. He said, Man, because of, because of your attitude towards your situation, because of how you handled your situation, 
Because I saw you on the news and you said, man, yeah, I know I got a paralyzed right on my hand, but you know what? God is still good and somebody has it a lot worse than me. He said, man, life had gotten really tough for me. He said, I'm a father, I got kids. He said, I got a wife. And he said, life had gotten so tough, I was about to walk out on my wife and my kids. And he said, when I saw that interview, that made me stand in front. He said, now me and my wife and my kids, man, we're out of that storm and we're doing great. That's one of my greatest moments in life. But when my father told me that, it took my mindset to another level. And so now I was at Krim High School, and some of you all may know about Krim High School, some of you all may not, but at the time when I was at Krim High School, the dropout rate was higher than the graduation rate. The name of this crime high school, they used to call it Crime High in Atlanta. People weren't just going to college in and out of there. We had a lot of great athletes that came through there. Some guys, they got caught up in the streets. Some guys, some other things happened. But we had something to go, you know, a while ago. But it was a great program, you know, all things considered. And so I was at Krim, and I wanted a scholarship really bad. And so here I was, this kid, and I'll never forget, I encountered a police officer one day when he first put the metal detectors in there, right? They put the metal detectors in there because he was having a lot of things going on that weren't supposed to be going on. And I'll never forget one morning I walked through the metal detector, and the man said, little man, what's your plan? I said, my plan is to go D1. He said, D1, what's that? I said, Division One, college, football, I'm going to Division One. He said, nah. I had dreads at the time. He said, nah. He said, you might end up at cell block, D1. I said, nah. You got the wrong one. <laughs> and my freshman year, I played at Krim High School, four sport athlete. At the end of my freshman year, my mother and father came to me. And they had the sweet deal, brother Stan. They had a sweet deal, right? They had a sweet deal. They said, Ink, listen, man, we got a sweet deal for you. Coaches across town, Tucker High School, they approached us. They said, now, all you have to do is play your next three years at Tucker High School. Coaches guarantee you a scholarship to the University of Georgia. All you have to do is do what you love. Football scholarship to the University of Georgia. Nobody in our family has ever been to college. I said, Mom and Dad, I really appreciate the offer, but I think I can make it for Krim. They said, ain't the chance of that happening, man. It's, it's slim to none. I said, yeah, but I think I can do it. I think I can make it from Krim High School. My father said, ain't, it's going to be really hard, man. I said, yeah, but I think I can do it. And so I called them on the action. I said, Mom, this is why we were in the park when I was seven years old. You sat in that big regal with your car lights on, right? I said, Pops, this is why we got up at 4.30 on Saturday mornings and ran miles and miles to that fire station. When you would drift off, I would look back at you and say, son, keep going. There's nobody working right now but me, you, and Michael Jordan. And whether that was true or not, I believed it, right? <laughs> They said, yeah, but at the end of the day, what do you think they did? They transferred my little butt anyway. <laughs> but I couldn't blame them because they really had my best interest at heart and they wanted me to go to college. And so I got over to Tucker High School in the first football game, I'll never forget it. I caught a bubble pass, I cut it up, I ran for about 10 yards, I got caught at the bottom of the pile. And so the guys kept folding on top of me and I loved the game of football, I loved it. You see, when well, most guys would step on the field and they would say, man, you see that girl in the stands? Man, you see all the people in the stands? I would step out on the field and I would say, man, I love the way this grass smells. <laughs> I love the way the grass smells. That's a different mindset. It's like you work, walking into your office at work and say, man, I love the way this office smells. They're going to look at you like you done lost your mind. <laughs> but I really did. I love that. Now, I never forget, I was at the bottom of the pile and yelling to the guy, I said, man, get up, man, get up, let's go, let's go, man, let's play. The guy kept falling, I was so small, I couldn't move anybody out of the way, and so before I knew it, one of the guys had grabbed my ankle, and I felt him when he grabbed it, I said, man, no, and he twisted it. He tore the ligaments in my hand, he put me out for the season, put me in a wheelchair, got out of the wheelchair, I was on crutches. After the season, I went back to my parents, and said, will you please transfer me back to Krim High School? <laughs> <laughs> my father, nope, nope. You stand at Tucker High School, now all you have to do is play your next two years. You have a scholarship to the University of Georgia. I said, Mom, would you please transfer me back? My father wasn't in the church at the time, my mother was. And so I went to my pastor. I go to St. Matthew's Baptist Church, a little small church on the east side of Atlanta. So I went to my pastor. I said, Pastor, listen. I said, man, you got to meet with my mother. I have to get back to Crim High School. I'll never forget. He said, Ink, let me stop you right there. He said, I know you want to get back to your little hood. He said, I know you're going to get back to your little homeboys and your little homegirls. He said, but son, let me tell you something. If I was to go to everybody in your family right now and ask them for $100, nobody could give it to me. 
He said, son, all you have to do is stay at that school now. Your next two years, they have guaranteed you a scholarship to the University of Georgia. All you have to do is do what you love. And now you want to go back to a place where the dropout rate is higher than the graduation rate. Now you want to go back to a place where you don't even have water bottles. You drink out of the opposing team's water hose. You want to go back to that place. And I looked at him, I said, I have to get back. And he set up the meeting, and this was the only thing I heard in the meeting. Him and my mother, they talked a lot, but this was the only thing I heard. And he said, Ruby, listen. He said, if it is in God's plans, not your plans. If it is in God's plans, not your plans. For Inky to go to college, Inky will go to college. You can't make that happen. She transferred me back to Crimson High School, the first football game of my junior year. Break my clap out for the season again. And so now at this point, I was that cat in the hood. I was going to corner drug dealers hanging out. I would say, man, I'm going to be the one to change the way that people think about this neighborhood. I would say, I'm going to be the one to put Prim High School on the map. I'm going to be the one to change my family situation. And so now, back when I was coming out of high school, your junior year was the year college scouts come in, recruit you, evaluate your tape, see if they want to offer you a scholarship. My junior year had no scholarship offer. And so now when I would be hanging out in the hood, the cats would come up to me and they would say, Ink, let us get this right. Aren't you the same cat that said you want to change your family situation? I would say, yeah. They would say, Ink, let us get this right. Aren't you the same cat that said you were going to put Grim High School on the map? I would say, yeah. They would say, Ink, let us get this right. Aren't you the same cat that said you were going to change the way that people thought about Kirkwood? I would say, yeah. They would say, your future is not looking so bright. They would say, maybe you will graduate high school and end up on one of these criminals selling dope like your uncles going in and out of prison. They got really discouraged. It's kind of like that quote that says, people too weak to follow their own dreams will always find a way to discourage you from following yours. They're too weak to do it. They don't want you to do it. It has nothing to do with you. You see, but my grandmother told me something when I was 139 pounds. I used to wear five XY t-shirts to school. I was 139 pounds. My Uncle Johnny had been trapping all night. The next morning, I would walk to him and I would take his 5X white t-shirt off. He's a big cat. I would take his 5X white t-shirt off and I would wear that white t-shirt and school drop below my knees. <laughs> and I saw the way some people looked at me and I saw the way some people laughed at me. And, you know, I got discouraged, man. And I'm going to be honest, in high school, I was a fighter. And me and my mother had to go before that Atlanta Public School Board my junior year. And they told my mother, they said, your son get in one more fight. <laughs> That joke a band from high school sports, period. He banned. No more. He ain't playing nothing. And so now the word got out. And so now I'll be walking on the court, the opposing coach would come by me and say, your daddy, a punk, your daddy, this and that, your mama, this and that, and I would have to bite my tongue. And so I got mad, and so people would talk about me, and so I got mad when I went to my grandmother, because my grandmother, she has this peace. You know how grandmother has peace in the middle of a storm, and you want to possess that? And she got faith in the middle of a storm, and you want that? One of the strongest people I know. And so I went to my grandmother, and I said, Grandma, I'm having some problems, all right? And I said, I don't want to do anything that can mess up my, my future. I don't want to do anything that can mess up my chances of going to college. and said, Ink, what's up? What's going on? I said, man, people are talking about me. People are talking trash to me. People are bothering me. People are messing with me. She said, what are they saying? I said, some people are talking about me wearing that 5X white t-shirt school and my 139 pounds. Some people are just talking trash. She said, so let me tell you something. She said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to use it as fuel to your fire. And also, never let someone's opinion of you become your reality. And so now from that point moving forward, I knew what to do with everybody's opinion, but my situation still said different. My situation, I was facing the odds, my situation said, and yeah, I know you want to go to college, but you have been injured the first game of your past two years. So nobody's coming into Prim High School to see you. And so I'll never forget that summer heading into my senior ball, God sent this amazing man, this amazing coach by the name of Dan Miles to Prim High School. See, I'm a firm believer that God will strategically place people in all of our lives mm -hmm. in order to help us to become the individuals that He wants us to become and get to the places that He wants us to go. And God sent this amazing man, this amazing coach to Crim High School, Darren Brown. And at the time, I had switched up my training. And so I'll never forget, he called me one summer day and I was playing AAU basketball at the time. And so before I left out of the house, my auntie Cookie said, you going to practice? I said, yeah. And the phone rang and she said, Ink, it's for you. And there's a coach on the line. And I went and got the phone, and it was Coach Miles. He said, Ink, what's up, man? I said, what's up, Coach? I heard you're the new football coach. He said, yeah, I am. He said, I heard you were a great athlete. I said, I'm okay. He said, well, why don't you come into practice? I said, oh, Coach, man, my dream changed. I'm going to the NBA, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to the NBA, man. I'm done. I'm 
governor of football. He said, is that right? I said, yes, sir. He said, you know what? He said, Ink, I heard you can do it, man. He said, I heard you can play basketball. I said, yes, sir, I can play a little bit. He said, as a matter of fact, I heard you average over 30 points per game as a point guard. Is that right? I said, yes, sir, you got the right guy. He said, well, well yeah, the smart guy, I want you to do a little research for me. He said, I want you to run your little butt up the Kirkwood Library. I want you to look on every NBA roster. You tell me how many 5'9", 139 pound point guards you <laughs> He said, then I want you to look on every NFL roster and you tell me how many five-nine cornerbacks you see, you give me a call back in the morning. I hung up the phone, I looked at my auntie, I said, I haven't even met this cat, he's trying to kill me, Jim. I sprinted to the library, I got on the computer, I looked on every NBA roster twice, I didn't see one five-nine cornerback. I looked on NFL roster, so five-nine corner, five-nine corner. I ran back home that day, I gave Coach Carly, picked up the phone, he said, what did you think? I said, I'll be at practice tomorrow. He said, <laughs> Make a long story short, I went out, I made it past the first game, that was a plus. I had a really strong senior season, but after my senior season, there was still two problems. I wasn't qualified to get into college, and I hadn't passed my Georgia high school graduation test. And so now college scouts would come to see me, and they would say, man, you're quick, man, you're fast, man, you're tough, man, you can play ball, but so we're not talking about college here. You're not even in a position to graduate high school. And so I would beg and plead with the scouts, I would say, man, just offer me a scholarship. I'm doing what I have to do in order to make it. I will make it, just offer me a scholarship. And they would say, ink, it doesn't work that way. And so I'm the type of guy, if I tell you I'm gonna do something, I'm gonna do it. I may not know how I'm gonna do it at that moment, but if I tell you I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna get it done. And whatever I have to go through in order to get it done, I'm willing to go through it. Whatever has to come with it, I'm willing to accept whatever has to come with it. And so I would tell the scholars, man, I'm picking up extra tutorial sessions. Man, I would make it, man, just offer me a scholarship. It would say, ink, it doesn't work that way. And I will never forget that a scout from Georgia Tech, he set up a meeting with me, my mother, and my father. And so I'll never forget, I thought it was that moment, right? I thought it was that moment, I said, man, I'm gonna go to Tech. And so my mother and father were so excited, they beat me to the school that morning. And so I'll never forget, I went into my grandmother and my grandfather's room that morning. My grandfather had been in a wheelchair his whole life, no legs. My grandmother sitting there on the edge of the with a Bible like usual. And I said, Grandma, I said, today I have a meeting with Georgia Tech University. I said, Georgia Tech is downtown Atlanta, we're right here in the city of Atlanta. And so you all get the opportunity to see me play ball. She smiled, she said, go get him, ain't I walked out of that house, I walked to school that day. <laughs> had my chest out, you know, I had my head up high. I'm passing the cats on the corner, I'm like, yeah, today is the day. When I got out of school, I'm gonna tell you cats, I'm going to D1. Get to the meeting, my mother smiling, my father, he's sitting there, you can see him happy. And the scout sit down, he got my transcripts and the qualifications that it takes to get in and join the tech. We weren't in the meeting, three minutes. He stood up, looked at my mother, he shifted. Looked at my father, he shifted. He stopped at me. I was sitting there, I'm like, go ahead, man, say it. Let's go. <laughs> Out of his mouth, he said, man, there's no way that you make it to college. So he just wasted my time. I looked down, I saw my mother's head drop. So my father's head dropped. I stood up right behind him. I looked at my mother and my father. I said, I guarantee you. I guarantee you your hard work will not go in vain. I guarantee you. Let me show you how God works. The next week at Krim High School, the same day of the week, me and all the seniors were sitting in the big classroom. I was sitting in the back. In walked my head football coach. He said, everybody be quiet. He said, do you guys know who this is? He presented him as a gift, and to the left of him still a fellow former head football coach, University of Tennessee Volunteer. And so Coach Foreman, he stepped up, you know, he pulled his crowd up. He's like, yeah, I know y'all know me. I'm, I'm that guy. I'm the man. <laughs> and the cats looked up. They looked at him. I said, nope. I don't know that cat. And they went back to talk. I was sitting in the back of the room beside my friend Leslie Jobs to tap him on his leg. I said, man, that's fellow former head football coach, University of Tennessee Volunteers. He said, oh. I said, man, fill the phone, check the board in zone, man. I said, Ink, I don't know what you're talking about, but I hope you get a scholarship and you get out of here. Went back to my head coach's office. We took a seat. Coach Phil Foreman looked me dead square in my eyes and said, Ink, I want to offer you a full scholarship to the University of Tennessee. I wasn't even qualified to get a job. So when God got something for you, can't nobody stop you.
And I got a little scared. I said, Coach, man, maybe he don't know my situation. I said, Coach, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm sitting there, it happened so fast. I got a little shook. I said, Coach, I said, you know my situation, right? Like, I wasn't even in position to graduate high school. I had like two more tests I had to take. I'm all messed up, right? I said, Coach, you know my situation, right? He said, yeah, I know your situation. I believe in He said, I see you in the summer. I said, Coach, I'm coming, man. <laughs> He said, Ink, I don't even think you understand how this process works. He said, son, first you take an official visit up to Nashville, you see the city, hang out with the coaches and the players, and then you make your decision if you're coming. I said, coach, I don't think you understand. <laughs> I said, but I'll take a visit, and I took a visit. On, I got up town on that Saturday because I had a basketball game that Friday night. And I'll never forget, I got up, and they took me to Calhoun's off the river, and came out. My host was Jason Swain at the time, so we come out of the restaurant. He like, Ink, man, we're about to have a big night, man. There's a sorority party, there's a barbecue, there's a basketball game. Which one do you want to go to? I said, man, if you don't mind, can you take me back to my hotel? I'm staying at the Marriott, we walk for Summit Hill. He said, what? He said, man, I don't know if you've ever been to a college sorority party, but it get pretty wild, and it's a barbecue, and it's a basketball game. We can go to all three if you like. I said, nah, man, cool. You can take me to my hotel. He said, okay, I'll still get my stipend. So we pull up to the Marriott and we're getting, <laughs> getting out of the car, right? And as I'm getting out of the car, he said, hold up. He said, man, are you sick? I said, no, nah, I'm not sick. You see what Swain didn't know about that moment? My first time being in the room with my own bag, King. <laughs> I didn't care nothing about this road, boy. I got up in that room, I hit my boy back in Kurt when I said, boy, y'all ain't gonna believe this. <laughs> I said, y'all boys gotta go to college. I don't know about that college. I said, boy, you get your own king size bed. <laughs> uh, and the next day, I went, I went to Coach Philip Foreman. I still do this until this day when I see that man because I'm forever grateful. Because he broke a generation of curse in my family. And I extended my hand to him and I shook his hand and I gave him a hug and I said, thank you. I said, not only for changing my life, but for changing countless others' lives back in Kirkwood that you know nothing about. I said, because coming from where I come from, we didn't see this happening every day. And so when I got back to Kirkwood, I went to them cats. I said, I told you guys, man, I told you cats that I was going to college. And so now everybody's response was, hey, why did you go back to Crim High School? Why did you take the role as child? Why did you go back where the dropout rate was higher than the graduation rate? You had an easier route. Why didn't you just stay at Tucker High School and go? I said, man, you guys are missing them all. I said, because the thing that happened, I got a chance to ride an airplane once when I was in high school. It was to an all-star game. Now, I'll never forget, I went into the restroom, and as I was leaving out of the restroom, there was this sign on the wall, and that sign said, as common courtesy to the person that's coming behind you, can you wipe the sink out even better than you found it? Well, as common courtesy to the kids that were coming behind me from high school, I was about to leave it better than I found it. Whatever sacrifice, whatever education I had to make, I was going to do it. You see, every night I slept on that floor, I had my three little cousins that slept on that same floor as me. And every night in the Mr. Roaches and Rats, I'm talking about some big Roaches and Rats too. <laughs> every night in the Mr. Roaches and Rats, you know what I had in my hand? I had that first football that I ever caught from my Uncle Gigi. And I would toss that football up in the air and I would catch it. And I would look at my little cousin and I would say, watch, wait until I make it to the NFL. This will be trouble. <laughs> and he would have this basketball, he would flip it up in the air, he would say, Ink, I can't wait until I make it to the NBA, man. It's going to be trouble. And the one beside him would have his baseball. Flip it up in the air, he said, Ink, I can't wait until I make it to the major leagues. It's gonna be trouble, man. And so the thing I knew personally in my spirit, I could have easily went across town, took a high school, went on to the University of Georgia. Great story, first generation of college student. But I still had to come back into Kirkwood. And the thing I knew, if I would have went to Georgia and came back into Kirkwood from Tucker High School, I'd ask my cousin, I said, man, why aren't you guys doing what you have to do in order to make it to college? They'd say, Ink, you went across town, we didn't have the same opportunity. So I wanted to remove any justification for any excuses. I don't believe in excuses. I don't believe in your product or your environment. No, you're a product of your decision and your choices. Every day you wake up. Every day you wake up, regardless of what you're going through, regardless of what has happened to you, regardless of the hand that life has dealt you, every day you wake up, one of the most powerful things that we possess as people is the ability to have a choice. Yes. And every day we wake up, we have a choice of the attitude that we will embrace toward life and the perspective that we will see life with. And as a result of me going back to Krim High School and going to college with all my three little cousins did, man, it could be done. <laughs> and all three of them got up off of that same, same floor and they went to college and they graduated. And now they serve in the army. That's why I went back to Krim High School. I love you. 
See, every day you wake up, two words should come to mind. Honor the legacy. Honor the ones that paved the way for you. Leave a legacy for the ones that's coming behind you. Every decision shouldn't just be about you. Because if you go through life and you live a selfish life, what's going to happen is that adversity is going to come. Murphy's Law is going to come. And if you haven't been living life the way that you're supposed to live life, the moment that you hit adversity, the thing that adversity always does every time, adversity will introduce you into who you really are as a person. Amen. And for some people, adversity introduces them into the person that they knew all along. For some people, adversity introduces them into a person that they never knew before. And they're sitting there, instead of saying, why me, why me? Instead of saying, try me. Instead of saying, man, why did this have to happen to me? Instead of saying, God, thank you for trusting me with the situation, they respond in a different way. You see, the thing about adversity, when you go through adversity to a certain magnitude, God has to trust you with that adversity that you will handle it in the right way. You see, people never understood when I said, thank you, God, for trusting me with this situation. Because he wouldn't take you through something of such magnitude if he didn't trust you to use it in the right way. Not if it's tough to battle to a strong soldier. You're not gonna just go through something if he does not trust you with that, to handle it in the right way, to use it in the right way, to be a blessing to other people. That's what life is about, man. That's what frees people. It's not about you going through something and you wallowing in your sorrow. It's about you facing it and that person over there is looking at you and saying, man, if he can deal with it in that way, if he can deal with it in that way, if he can still smile about it and say, man, God is good, so can I. I had got up to around 153 pounds. <laughs> Soaking wet. <laughs> Feeling good. First Johnson, and then made me proud. It was such a big deal, right? My grandma, she still sit on the same pew at church ever since I was a little boy. And when I was going to college, right, when they found out I got a scholarship, People passed the mothers at my church. We got an old school church. We still got the same pastor, right? Ever since you little boy, he's still hooping and hollering. He's all the baby in the door. <laughs> right, they still do the same deal, right? Ever since I was a kid. And so they got this deal to where, you know, everybody come around, Mr. Mother's over there. So they got the hats on, you know, they dressed up, they got the gloves, right? And they sitting over, it's about two, three rows up. So everybody get up and they walk by the mothers and they shake their hands and they give them a hug. Oh, hey, mother, how you doing? And so when my grandma found out I was going to college, everybody that came by Daisy Jones, hey, Miss Daisy Jones, hey, baby, you know Inky going to college. <laughs> <laughs> you know my grandson Inky going to that University of Tennessee, don't you? <laughs> they saw my mom. They catch her at the beauty shop. They catch her somewhere. Hey, Miss Ruby, hey, you know my son Inky going to college, don't you? <laughs> They see my little cousin, hey man, how y'all boys doing? Hey man, we doing great. Man, you know our big cousin, Inky going to college, don't you? It was a big deal. And so when I got up to college, I was feeling good about myself, and I'll never forget the first media day, an article came out, and that article read, Mr. No Star has made it to the SEC. Basically saying that nobody had made it to the SEC. How did this happen? You see, I wasn't ranked by Robert. I didn't have all the accolades. The only thing I had was my last name and my work ethic. And so the cats in my class, they were laughing. They said, Ink, have you seen this? I said, no, let me see it. Let me give it to me. And I held it up and I said, Mr. No Star, the cat that came from that two bedroom home, 14 individuals, Mr. No Star, the cat that sleep, slept on that floor, Mr. No Star, the cat that was in the park with his mother when I was seven years old, and she sat in that beer creek when I took it and I folded it up and I put it in my back pocket. That same day, we were walking to Neyland Stadium and they used to make us walk in this straight line, right? And so we're walking and out of the blue came this reporter. He had his little bag on, he had his, his little camera around his neck, he had his pen and his pad out. So he's walking up to us and I thought to myself, I said, sure enough, this guy's not coming to talk to me. I'm Mr. No Star. You got Gerard Lee on the class, middle linebacker for the Patriots, first round 10th pick. You got Robert Harris in the class, first round 18th pick to the Denver Broncos, then he plays for the New York Giants. You had Ramon Foster in the class, starting guard Pittsburgh Steelers. You had all these high profile guys. And sure enough, as this guy got closer, he was coming directly to me. You see, I was that cat when I first hit campus, we would go out and people would see the football players. They'd say, man, it's the football player. Man, it's Rob Lee or man, Robert Ed. They'd get me up and say, man, what do you play? I'd say, yeah, I swear. <laughs> put the spotlight on, right? They're going to put the spotlight on. And sure enough, this cat came directly up to me and he said, Inky Johnson. I said, yes, sir, what you got? I was raised to respect. Yes, sir, what you got? He said, man, do you even think you're going to play at the University of Tennessee? I said, you made a mistake. I said, I would start at the University of Tennessee. 
So let me tell you something. I said, you can measure the height of a man. You can measure the weight of a man. I said, you can't measure a man's heart. And he started laughing and he walked off. Made me hot as fish grease, too. <laughs> I wanted to box him out there, right? At the media day, everybody got dressed and they went home. And I went into the football complex and I was putting on my cleats and my workout clothes. And I was sitting there and my friends Rob Mayo came in. It was pitch black in the football complex. He said, Ink, what you doing, man? Let's go to the dorm, man. It's dark. I said, no, nah, man, I'm going to work. He said, man, it's dark. Go to work in the morning, man. Let's go. I said, no, nah, man, I'm going to work. He said, man, this is what that reporter said, get to you, man, that cat probably never played looking football in his life. I said, no, nah, man, I said, man, I'm just going to work. Really, I had gotten to me. <laughs> and I went out on that turf, and I went to perfecting my craft, and I envisioned everybody that ever believed in me. And I was working out hour after hour, and I looked up at the clock, and it was around 1.30 in the morning. And a custodian came out to the church toward me. He said, son, what are you still doing out here? Aren't you supposed to be over here going to sleep? I said, sir, no disrespect. I have this dream that I'm chasing that I have to make take shape of my life. I have a family that's really dependent on me in Atlanta. You say, I'm from the hood, for real. And I left Atlanta, Georgia. My family said, there goes our meal ticket. Meaning if Inky Johnson don't make it, we don't need it. And so every night I would leave study hall at 10.30, I would sprint over to the indoor football facility, last door on the left, sprint across that turf, into the locker room, look out till about 11.30, 12, every night faithfully, except on Friday nights, we'd be standing in the crown plaza getting ready for the game on Saturdays. Freshman year came, played a little special teams, sophomore season came, guess what happened, Coach Jackson? I messed around, broke that star line. I looked for that reporter every Tuesday immediately. I never saw him again in my life. I showed up looking for him, where that cat at? He haven't been back. But I went on and had a strong sophomore season. And so the summer heading into my junior year, man, I had got as strong as I'd ever been in my life. I had bench pressed one time. I maxed out 325 one time. I ran a 438 and a 40 one time. I was cat like quick. I can cover anybody, man. I was a student of the game. I was on track to graduate in three years. I was feeling myself, man. I had been discipled spiritually my sophomore season. And so I had gotten to the point, finally, to where my life felt as if it was in shape. Everything was coming together. Now, I'll never forget before our first football game, I called my mother and my grandmother on the three where I said, after this season, our lives are about to change forever. There will be no more struggles. There will be no more ropes and rats. After this season, our lives are about to change forever. And little did I know, our lives are really about to change. I'll never forget, we went out our first game, we played against California Bears, and our team, man, we executed all phases of the game, offense, defense, special teams. We went out, we got the victory, I got an interception, a couple big hits, a couple pass breakups, everything went great. Second game, we're playing against the University of Air Force. These guys didn't even supposed to be on the schedule. Coach agreed to put them on the schedule at the last minute. Found ourselves in a dog fight. Fourth quarter rolled around, Air Force, they came out, they scored, they onside kicked the ball, guess the who, me. I jumped for it, I missed it, a guy on Air Force team laid me out, Air Force recovered. Now they got the ball going for the winning drive in Neyland Stadium, major upset alert. I'm mad, I'm frustrated. We go in the huddle on defense, middle linebacker call, quarters coverage, ready to break. I said, guys, get back in here. I said, listen, whoever gets the ball on Air Force's team, let me get it. I said, let me hit it. I said, I'm gonna hit him, I'm gonna break his spirit, I'm gonna make him fumble, I'll recover the fumble, I'll run it for a touchdown. I guarantee you, this will be the end of the story. Rob Mayo looked at me and said, ain't one of the rest of us just go to the sideline and we'll make the play by the side. I said, yeah, man, I'm feeling that type of way right now. And for some reason, this play started to unfold as slow and as clear as I'd ever seen a football play unfold in my life. I'll never forget the snap of the ball. I saw a left defensive man. He came off the ball. Robert Edge made a quick move on the tackle. He had a clear shot at the quarterback. I went running forward with my arm in the air. I said, man, that's a sack. Oh, my roommate, I know Rob. At the last minute, the quarterback sidestepped me and missed him. Immediately, my eyes shifted to the wheel linebacker. I saw the running back coming behind the line of scrimmage. The running back crossed my wheel linebacker's face. That let me know my wheel linebacker's eyes got caught inside. He had busted. So at this point, the running back is coming down my sideline. My eyes shifted immediately to the quarterback. The quarterback was releasing the ball to the running back coming down my sideline. And before I took off, I said, thank you, God. I got exactly what I asked for. Be careful what you ask for. You just might give it to me. <laughs> And I approached it the way that I always approached anything in my life. And the way I approached the tackle, I was so small, I couldn't size anybody up. Like, I couldn't come in there with like EB. EB coming there, he gonna knock your block off, right? <laughs> I couldn't come in there, I gotta, I gotta find a way to get you. Right? I was so small, you, you might, he liable to run me over. And so I was looking at the cat, I said, man, I'm gonna just go for it. I'm gonna just go for the gusto. Whatever happens, happens. But at the point of contact, when I hit this guy, 
something different happened that had never happened to me before in my life. I hit this guy and it seemed as if every breath in my body left. My body went completely limp, fell to the ground, and I blacked out. And my eyes opened, my teammates were running over to me. They said, Ink, get up, let's go, man. I said, I can't. They said, what do you mean you can't, man? You always get up. Get up, let's go. I said, I know, man, but this time I can't. I said, there's a shock going through my whole body. I can't feel anything. One of the scariest moments of my life. The shock eventually left, but it stayed in my right arm and hand. I remember as I was lying there, I flipped my head to the left. I saw the doctors and the trainers running onto the field. I flipped my head up to the sky and said, God, I said, surely nothing has happened in this moment that can alter my life. I flipped my head back over to the left. I saw them bring the spine board up. I flipped my head back up to the sky and said, God, I said, they have to do that, right? I said, that's precautionary, man. They get me up on the spine board. They're willing me off the field. We get to about midfield. I looked at the doctor. I couldn't feel my right arm and hand. So I said, Doc, can you raise my right arm and hand up? He said, sure, eh? I lifted my left and the crowd was saying, Oogie Johnson. And I pumped my left fist to the supporter. And I said, Doc, you can bring it down. And as he was bringing my arm and hand down, I'll never forget, I looked at him. I said, oh, yeah. I said, I'll be back. Never thinking that would be my last game at New York State. They rolled me to the ambulance. My father was waiting there. I looked up. I said, Pop, did I get it? I said, yes, yeah, son, but I think you got the worst part of it. They got me in the ambulance. They rolled me over to UT Medical. They took me back. They ran some CAT scans, and they brought me back into my room, and all in a 15-second time frame. I'll never forget it. I saw my father. He stepped in, and he looked at me. He shook his head, and he walked out. My mother, she came into the room, she said a quick prayer by my bedside, and she walked out, and so she walked out, the doctor walked in, and said, hey, get in here, we gotta rush this guy back to surgery, he's about to die. And I said, what? I said, what happened? And his son, what happened? You have busted up some clay and artery in your chest, you're bleeding internally, we have to rush you back, take the main vein out of your left leg and plug it into your chest in order to save your life. When I opened my eyes from recovery from that surgery, the same doctor was standing over me and said, son, got some good news and some bad news for you. I said, you got some bad news for me? I tell me I'm about to die. How bad can it get? <laughs> I'm still here, right? He said, yeah. He said, the good news is you saved your life. He said, the bad news is you have nerve damage in your right shoulder. We don't know how much. He said, we got to send you up to the Mayo Clinic. See a team of nerve specialists. I was like, all right, cool. He's like, well, son, you probably can never play the game of football again. I was like, nah. You see, I respected the doctor. I respected his expertise, but I had been through adversity before. See, I said nothing against this doctor, but this doctor was in an apartment with me and my mother when I was seven years old and she was sitting there through the regal. Nothing against this doctor, but that doctor didn't come up in Kirkwood. Nothing against this doctor, but I had missed meals before. I remember being a kid waking up on Christmas at my Uncle JJ house, and I'll never forget my Uncle JJ had work. He bought me and my cousin Tamar in black and white and blue and white Dion Sanders. I'll never forget it. Right? And me and Tamar used to be out in the street racing, and when my Uncle JJ bought us in black and white and blue and white Dion Sanders, and we used to sleep in the living room on a pallet, right? Y'all know the pallets, right? We used to sleep on the floor of the pallets, right? And so that Christmas Eve, me and Tamar, we kept running into the other room. We're looking at them Dion, just, ooh, boy, you can't be fake. <laughs> come back. Came back in there. Ooh, what? Smoke you and them juice tomorrow. He came back in there. Jones was gone. Cat and then came through the one that took everything. I had been through adversity before. Nothing had ever stopped me. I remember when me and my mother and we stayed behind Kirkwood Post Office. And I'll never forget it that night we were sitting in the living room and my mom, she was sitting there, and she said, Ain't hey, take this glass in the kitchen. And you know, it's dark and it's late, and I took the glass and I, I put it in the kitchen. Boom. I ran back in there with my mom and I heard it drop. And she said, go get it. I said, mm -hmm, I ain't going back in there. <laughs> she said, boy, go get the glass. Go pick the glass up. I said, well, I ain't going back in there. Dog, I'm late. I'm like, what? She said, boy, go get the glass. I said, all right, all right, I go back in there. I went back in there and the whole kitchen was on fire. Now, I never forget, they had to rally everybody up and I was standing out in the parking lot. I never forget, and I watched my uncle. They took my grandfather, they tossed him off the porch, and the other ones guarded him. My Uncle Sammy came off the porch. There was a cat running from behind the house, and I set our house on the fire behind the throat, and he the bag. He shot him. 
I remember sitting in the living room some days and we'd be sitting there and we'd be watching cartoons and we'd be eating our fruit loops and boom! Don't get kicked down. Boom! Red dogs coming in and they laying everybody down. And I watched him grab my grandfather out of his wheelchair who had no legs and sharing him on his face in front of me and I'm sitting there and I'm looking at him. And couldn't do nothing about it. <coughs> nothing that ever stopped me. All of that drove me, all of that propelled me to be the man that I am today. So I said, man, there's no way that my career could be over. You see, I can stand right in this church and look everybody in your face. I've never cheated myself. I've never came from short of a line. A coach didn't have to watch me work out. I was going to give everything I had to everything I was involved in. Anyway, because everything that I do, I consider it a blessing to be able to do it. I said, there's no way. You see, I was that cat. If I would be away from with my teammate and I couldn't get my teammate to stay, I would do my workout. I would go to his company, take this workout, and do his workout. That's what I was on. So man, there's no way my career can be over. Send me up to the Mayo Clinic. My career can be over. My mother sent me off to this track. And I'll never forget the last visit at the Mayo Clinic. It was me, my mother, my father, and the doctor walked into the room and said, Ethan Johnson, here's the deal. They said, son, you have torn all the nerves in your brachial plexus. Your brachial plexus are the nerve roots that go from the spine that controls your arm and your hand. They said, you have torn them at all levels. They can't be plugged. They can't be put together. They said, son, we hate to tell you, but your arm, it will never be the same again. They said, your hand, it will never be the same again. They said, son, you can never play the game of football again. We understand prior to college, you have been a four-sport athlete your whole life. You can never play basketball again. You can never play baseball again. Your arm will never be in a condition for you to run track. Because as an athlete, when they tell you, man, you can't play football, your mindset automatically shifts. You say, OK, I can't play football. I average over 30 points per game in basketball. I just drive in the hallway. I'm moving. So you can never play basketball. OK, I play travel league baseball. I've had clean up and play center field my whole life prior to college. I'll just play baseball. Son, you can never play baseball again. Okay, I'll play fast. I have some speed. I'll just get out on the track. Son, your arm will never be in a condition for you to run track again. What do you do when all your options get taken away in an instant? And then they proceeded to say, here are your surgery options. You can take a muscle out of the back of your left leg, plug it into your right arm, but there's a possibility that you'll be left with the weak left leg and the weak right arm the rest of your life. Or you can take a nerve out of your left arm, rewrite it up through your chest, down into your right arm, but there's a possibility that you'll be left with two weak arms the rest of your life. Or you can take a nerve out of your left rib, rewrite it up through your chest, down into your right arm, but there's a possibility that you'll be left with a breathing problem and a weak right arm the rest of your life. By the way, tell us what you want to do in the morning. I was 20 years old and I... I'll never forget, I walked out of that office. I don't know if anybody in this room has ever felt this way, but I tried my best to make it to my hotel room door, and it seemed as if every step I took, the burden literally got heavier and heavier until it weighed me down to the floor. I didn't even make it to my door. And I'm gonna be honest, I needed some answers, and I needed them quick, because I was in the middle of a situation that I didn't understand, that I didn't know what was gonna happen, and I needed some answers, and I needed somebody to talk to. And my mother and father, they took a seat across the hall from me, and I looked at my pops, I'll never forget. I said, man, what would you do, man? What option would you choose? What would you say? Like, what, what would you do? What, what would you say? And I'll never forget, my father dropped his head and picked his head up and he looked at me. And for the first time in my life, I saw tears rolling down my father's eyes. I never saw my father cry. You see, my father had told me my whole life, so we are born. You see, nothing can break us, man. Nothing can make us give up. Nothing can make us give in. There is nobody else on the face of this planet that's of the pedigree that we are. So nothing can stop us. And for the first time in my life, I saw tears rolling down my father's face. And so what registered in my mind as a green 20 year old, I said, man, me and my father are no longer in my heart. And he looked up at me and my father said, son, for the life of me, for the life of me, man, I just can't understand why bad things happen to good people. He said that two people that I considered to be good people was my mother and you, and something bad has happened to both of them. I lost my mother when I was 14 years old with cancer. He said, Inc., I remember when you were at the top of your game, and I would call you and I would say, son, are you headed to a party? Where you headed to? My papa, you're a wild boy. You get busy, right? He said, are you headed to a party? Inc., where you headed to? I said, no, nah, man, I'm headed to Bible study. I'm headed to discipleship. And he said, man, I'll tell them all that they can do. And he picked his arms up and he slammed them down and he tried to break them through. And I shifted and I looked at my mother and I said, what would you do? What would you say? And she would fall. But she looked at me. And she said, son, don't you worry about it. She said, God is in control. And I looked down at my wrist in that moment. I used to wear this black bracelet. I played every game in it. I did every workout in it. I never took it off until I was a grad assistant coach over on Lane Kiffin's staff, and after the game, I gave it to a little boy. But on that bracelet, that night in Rochester, Minnesota, lie conviction. That bracelet read, man of faith. You see, I was just like everybody else. You got faith? Yeah, I got faith. 
Big faith, big power, right? Little faith, little power. Faith and fear can't reside in the same mind. Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I knew all the faith lines that I had yet to be placed in a situation that required me to use my faith. When I was placed in a situation that required me to use my faith, I was left questioning God. Can I be real with you? A faith that has not been tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. The next morning I got up, I went into the doctor's office. They said, son, what option are you choosing? I said, no disrespect to your doctor, I'm not choosing an option. My situation is out of your hands. They said, what do you mean your situation is out of my hands? We're some of the best doctors in the world. We're the reason that you came up here. I said, no disrespect to you, doc. My situation is out of your hands. I'm not choosing an option. Do what you have to do. I know I will come out of this okay. And as I stand right here before you today, I think I came out okay. As a matter of fact, I think I came out 10 times stronger. You see, but when I came out of that hospital, my life had changed. You see, I've been right hand dominant my whole life. Now I can no longer use my right arm and hand. I had over 350 staples in my body. Now I had to go to people that I didn't know in public and say, hey man, can you help me tie my shoe? Now I had to get bathed by another man. Now I had to learn how to write my name all over again. But that process did something, man. That process did something, man. I'm gonna tell you what that process did. You see, me and my roommates, we have been discipled a year prior to my injury. And the most amazing thing happened. You see, from the outside looking in, everybody said, man, that cat going through it. But what they didn't know, the cats that I had in my inner circle. That's why it's so important to be covered with. Right. 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 Some people, they go through the street, they ain't got the right people to love them. Amen. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kind, because the testing of your faith goes on to produce perseverance, and perseverance must finish its race so that you may be complete and lacking nothing, meaning you have to go through something in order to become the individual that God wants you to become. Right. They might see me on the road, they would say, Ink, man, how you doing? I said, man, I don't know how I got to this day. Man, Ink, you remember that Romans 8, 28, and it starts us off with conviction, and it says, and we know, every individual in this room, and we know that all things were not some things, not most things. I really was in that hospital. 
I really heard those words. I really had over 350 staples in my body. I really was told to go to this hospital in 30 to 45 days, and I was going to that hospital on the third day. But it wasn't by my might, it wasn't by my power. You see, every day the thing I understand about life, things are gonna happen. That's now. We can't control life. The thing that we can't control is how we respond. God said no in my life. He said no in my life. When I wanted that NFL, and I was eight games away from it, and I thought I was stoned, I thought I was quick, and I loved that game of football, and I loved to make a tackle. I was 320, I was then pressing 325 pounds, I was running at 4 3. I was feeling good, I was quick, I could cover anybody, I could, I could call a play before it happened. I was at the top of my game, man. And I went to make that tackle. And I said, oh God.